Podcast. Hello, everybody. This is James Chai, Arf Arf Bark Bark Rescue Foundation, registered nonprofit, and I am coming to you on a beautiful October 17th, 2019, episode number 23. And I hope everyone's doing really well. It's about uh, it's about eight thirty-five, eight thirty-six here local time uh, PST Pacific Standard Time on the west coast of Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada, and it is raining. And it's a beautiful, horrible, yucky, typical Vancouver day uh, for everybody who has a dog out there. Please, uh, I hope you you have a, a rain jacket for your dog. Uh, so that they're nice and warm and they're not feeling too chilly and all that. It is uh, it is pretty cold, and you can imagine if you've got some heat on your body and it starts raining, and what's going to end up happening is that as the rain hits you, uh, you're walking outside, you're wearing a t-shirt, rain's hitting you, it's going to start pulling the uh, the moisture from your body. I'm sorry, it's going to start pulling the heat from your body, and it's going to pull it out, and then eventually you're going to start getting cold, and we start shivering. If you see that with the dog themselves, uh, when they're out there, uh, our dogs out in the rain, um, if they don't have a rain jacket or something along those lines to keep them warm, then they will start to lose heat as well. And uh, a lot of people will say, you know, my dog's fine outside in the rain and they don't mind it. Well, it's not that they have a choice, right? I mean, if you don't have a choice, what are you going to do? If your car breaks down in the middle of nowhere, you're like five kilometers away or five miles away from a, 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 even a, a, a gas a cell service or a gas station, you don't have a choice. You're going to walk the five kilometers as much as you hate it. Um, so, you know, if you don't have, if you can't afford a, a rain jacket, you can get a, an old somewhat waterproof or water resistant uh, human shirt. Um, you can get a smaller one like the babies have or up to a larger one for an adult that can fit into a Mastiff or a Great Dane. And then you can kind of uh, help your dogs stay a little bit more drier in this uh, area. They are going to be cold. And, uh, you know, again, people say, oh, the dogs, my dog's fine out in the rain and they don't mind being wet. Uh, again, the reality is that they are going to be losing a significant amount of heat as they are walking through. And it will contribute to them being somewhat, for those of us who have dysfunctional dogs or work with dysfunctional dogs, it's going to create a bit of uh, anxiety, a little anxiety, a little, a little agitation, irritation, of course, right? If you're not feeling well and then something triggers you, then you're not really feeling well. So, um, again, if you have the chance, try to keep your uh, your puppies nice and warm. And, um, you know, I've seen people walk around with umbrellas over their dogs and themselves with a huge umbrella. So that's kind of, kind of, kind of really dedicated. But, you know, if that happens, it happens. So, um, yeah, definitely try to uh, do that. One of the things I want to kind of put that to scale in regards to the, the loss of moisture, uh, I mean, loss of heat due to the moisture, is uh, you ever wash your hands in the sink and you and you just kind of walk, you know, you ch or, or you go to take a shower and you put your hand, you know, you're, you're heating up the water and you think it's warm, it's warm for your hands and then you go, oh, this is great. And then you step into the shower, put your head underneath the water and suddenly the water's freezing cold, even though literally with your hands it was nice and warm right because the acclimation of your hands the heat the temperature um that part of it and then when you stick your head in it's just going to wick away because your hair acts as an insulation and then all the heat's going to wick away it's going to wash away and that's why your head feels like oh my gosh it's too cold so i uh, just want to keep everyone in mind with that part when it happens and also when it starts to snow it hasn't snowed some places up north it has started to snow Please make sure that um, when your dogs are out there walking in the snow, that if you're walking on the roadways uh, or even on the sidewalks, when people start uh, shoveling the, uh, the snow from the sidewalks, they start salting it. That salt can get into your dog's paws. It can cling to your dog's paws. And when they get home, they start to lick it off. And sometimes that salt can be quite toxic, depending on what the uh, chemical, if it's a salt melter, it's definitely going to be chemical wise and um, I'm just gonna clear that off and it can cause some toxic uh, 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 dangers to your to your dog so remember when it starts to snow when people start to ice uh, uh, their sidewalks start to ice up they're gonna throw the salt down please make sure that you check your dog's paws so that they don't lick that salt and or the chemicals and then end up dying another thing um, I think Irene McIntosh uh, no not Irene uh, somebody else uh, had told me as well, and I've said this before, is if you're walking around in the, uh, in the uh, you know, around the neighborhood and your dog likes to eat grass, just be careful that you don't let your dog eat the grass that, well, don't let your dog eat grass anyways. And the main reason is because it's just the risk that, especially if you have a nice looking lawn in front of you 
and your dog starts eating that grass, a lot of times it's, it's chemically treated with pesticides and then that can cause some issues as well, especially uh, creating a, a bit of sickness inside of you. We had a friend's dog pass away from licking rolled salt from Yeah, see. And it's a horrible death. It's a horrible death, Daniel, in the fact that your dog is in pain and they don't know why they're in pain and they're suffering. Like when a dog bloats, uh, you know, a lot of things, a dog has a heart attack, uh, you know, things I've witnessed personally, um, they, they are suffering and they don't know why. And you see the look in their eyes as they are just dying um, and they're in intense pain. And because dogs process pain in redundant format, which I'll talk about in another time frame once we all kind of get up to the speed of how my brain works. Um, they, 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 they just don't understand the pain that they're feeling. And, and further than that, they just go into shock and the pain is so intense that they don't know how to deal with it. And they die. And the, the worst part is dogs don't know the, the concept of death. Um, so to them, they're just not understanding what's going on, why they are suffering. Um, you know, I've seen a dog uh, be attacked uh, 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 quite viciously by two dogs. And the look in the dog, the one dog's face, is, is literally what you see in the safari videos, the National Geographic vehicle uh, videos, um, where the dog's eyes just disappear. They just, they just, they go into that place where they, they know they're going to die. So um, it's really quite difficult. And, uh, you know, the most important thing for me is for your dogs to be safe. And I'm going to try to do these little PSA things while I, I move forward whenever it comes to my mind. Um, you know, Dan, I really appreciate your comment because. Um, it's it's tough, right? Same with leaving a collar on your dog when you when you put them in the kennel or you crate them. The collar can get caught in the wire and then they suffocate and they die a horrific death that takes three minutes. I am graphic on purpose. I'm graphic on purpose because it will strike our emotionality and, and be impactful. And I'd rather people say, well, you know, I don't like it when James talks about this because it's so graphic and all that, but you won't forget it. And if that prevents a death, that prevents a death, right? Because, um, you know, like I say, there's 6 million dogs that are killed annually in North America. And almost 100 million dogs in North America living in domesticated environments, not shelters and all that stuff. Um, losing, one person losing their own dog is incredibly painful. And we see the post here, um, uh, somebody um, um, who, to who I talked about had just uh, recently lost their dog, very recently um, uh, her dog, um, I, I won't say her name, not the dog's name, but I uh, did lose her dog uh, recently uh, because of a, a, a discovery diagnosis of cancer, um, a bit foregone, f a, a, you know, and unfortunately the age and all these other things happened, right? So um, that happened, right? And, the, you know, anybody, you know, my mom had colon cancer, uh, yeah, colon cancer. Uh, I say, yeah, because I can't remember because they also had to work on her stomach as well like the upper part of her intestines and, and, and bones and all that stuff. And she survived. But I do know that she said that it hurt like crazy while she didn't know what was happening. And then when they found out the diagnosis, they were supposed to, they were supposed to only operate, I think it was uh, for uh, th three to five hours. And it ended up being eight hours plus. And they said it was a, quite an extensive thing. And my mom has a high pain tolerance. We all have high pain tolerances. Again, it's part of that dog uh, redundancy aspect of it. And so, long story short, you know, my mom suffered. And anybody who's had a loved one, a friend, a colleague, a, a, a contact who has cancer uh, or had cancer, you know that it's very painful. So for the dogs are themselves, they look like they're not having an issue, but you know they're in, in intense pain. So it's, um, it's, uh, it's very difficult. So uh, whatever we can do to help uh, reduce that amount of things, um, Let's do it, right? Let's let's do it. Okay, uh, kind of going forward here now. Um, uh, please uh, support my YouTube channel. Please subscribe to it. The link is in my uh, in my page. Uh, this is a uh, free vlog that I do. I, I'm just trying to build up the, the the my reach. I'm trying to build up the people, uh, my audience, so that more and more people know what I'm doing, and um, uh, all my stuff works. There's no aspects of treats or medication or uh, or painful or forceful aspects of uh, of brute force uh, corrections on any of these dogs here. Um, the bigger dogs, the Great Danes that I work with, uh, of course, I've got to use much more force on them, and it's commensurate to their amount of uh, of size and, and reactivity. Um, but um, you know, 
I'm doing this because uh, through my experience, you know, I, I've got over 1,400 days, over 20,000 hours working alone by myself with, with giant dogs that have attacked upwards of 16 people out in New York. And they come to me, hey, Rita. And um, all these things that are happening to me are super, uh, super personal experiences that I've had. And anyone who has ever lived in an extremely dangerous situation, uh, you know how psychologically draining and, and difficult that can be. If you're uh, living with someone, a human being, that is quite psychologically damaging. Um, it's kind of like that for me, working with these guys. It's like living with a serial killer and a lion all rolled into one is the fact that the you know the history of this the lion and you know what the lion can do to you. And when it has happened to me, uh, it, it's, 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 it's pretty scary. And um, But my need is to help do this and and the dogs that I've worked with the, the extreme cases, all these dogs are done for free. It's all pro bono, and um, the equal value. You know, I'm dealing with a V9, V10 scale where everybody else is working with a V4, V5, maybe V6 at the most, and uh, they're charging nine to nine thousand dollars US and higher for for three to four weeks of board and train with shock collar behavior and all that stuff. Every dog that I've worked with has been without medication, without treats, without shock collars, just a regular fabric collar and a leash like Zeus uh, yesterday asked me about. So um, just want to share what I'm doing and if you can please share my posts, if you can please share uh, the work that I do and just get the word out because the more people who know and see what I'm doing and see it works for themselves, you get to your friends, you, you yourself get to self-train your own dog at home without having to pay uh, a, a, a trainer behaviors for things that you can do yourself and you know for example hey Sean um, you know for example uh, I do one episode about um, how to to the, the psychology of buying the proper leash and that will address probably upwards of 30 percent of the people who have issues with their dogs with leashes and the dog's behavior on leash that would normally those 30% would go and hire trainer behaviors to do so, right? And it's tough for the trainer behaviors to work on something that's somewhat mundane or that they don't have a, a full concept of or they're incorrectly providing information that's not accurate and then your dog doesn't understand what's going on. Everything I work on is based on the, uh, on the central point of codependency on the dog being a covert, I mean, sorry, uh, an overt codependent, human beings being a covert codependent, which are cohabitation through the 10,000 plus years that scientists say has evolved through what I call in term emotional isomorphism, which is having two somewhat different genetic structures, right? Animal species and convergence on the point of our emotional context as we run parallel somewhat, even uh, even aligned at times. And that's why we have that ability to cohabitate with a cross species. Okay, the, the complicated talk and all that stuff is uh, past that. Again, uh, if you can subscribe to my YouTube channel, I just need 549 more subscribers to hit a thousand. Uh, and then I can stop bugging people as much, uh, y'all. Okay, uh, and I, I want to say thank you to uh, Jackie Spurrack uh, from Awesome Massive Lovers, uh, helping her with her group. Uh, she invited me to help her group with um, building up uh, um, training, uh, on, uh, uh, live training uh, vlogs for her members on Tuesdays. So we we might integrate that here on to Thursday, uh, sorry, Tuesdays here at the same time. Uh, we'll have to see what goes on. Uh, her group's going great. Her group was like, I think it was, uh, you know, nothing to do with me, but the way she, the, the way some, you know, some of these amazing people who admin these groups are just phenomenal. They're having structures. They're all doing it for free. They're having structures and schedules and advice and, and they're vetting out all the information that they have and then boom, 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 they're getting it all out. And it's just gorgeous what's going on uh, for people who are doing that. And, um, you know, uh, politics aside, if you're in with a group, that's great. Do it. If the group turns out to be somewhat mercurial or tyrant, I uh, like, then you may want to leave that because it contributes and it enables uh, and creates complicity, uh, complicit uh, behavior. That's my rant. Has everyone uh, rail? Not a rant, but a rail. That's everyone knows. Okay, so uh, today we've got choices again of these three issues here. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, the third one for sure, but uh, the first one I, I kind of mentioned yesterday. I might bring that up again. Um, I might do that next uh, next time. I probably will. Um, I'm going to keep this relatively short because uh, I'm going two hours again. Um, uh, the first one was again yesterday I mentioned was why dogs are afraid of bridges. Relation and it's relational to their field of vision, right? The processing, the field of vision is relational to their dog to your dog's logic processing. It's relational to your dog's historical context. 
It's relational to your dog's understanding of physics as per se, as in relative to your dog's comprehensive ability, the understanding of physics and so forth like that. Yeah, definitely read and wash your uh, wash your uh, your puppy's uh, rolled salt off of um, off of her feet. Um, yeah, for sure. Um, just a reminder. I mean, it's I'm just trying to think on my end, and there's going to be times where I'm looking at things on other groups and posts, and then I'll say, hey, you know what? This is what I read in this group. Um, you know, I have no problem um, uh, promoting other groups and saying things about other groups uh, because I think it's important, and I'm only going to do those that I feel are uh, um, progressive or supportive of the overall dog industry and so forth. You know, there are almost 1 billion, with a B, the letter B, 1 billion dogs estimated in the world. So, um, you know, a lot of strays, obviously, but, you know, if we can get this stuff kind of worked out and, and hopefully, you know, have some clarity on it. Okay, so that's about the part about bridges and so forth. And, and, and you know, I've got some dogs here who are afraid to walk on the bridge um, for certain reasons. It's relative perspective, all these kinds of things. Uh, the, the same with the dogs that walk on the grates and all that stuff, right? The metal grates and, and so forth. It, 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 when, 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 it's, when I explain it to you, you're just going to go, yeah, that makes sense. Like I'm not creating, like I, I might create a, a, a mini epiphany in what I say to everyone who's watching, it's more the fact that I want to bring common sense to it and want to bring the, the the psychology, the human psychosis that occurs in us, bridging that into the dog behavior at the dog's processing speed of one tenth of a second and the dog's rudimentary uh, logic and emotional processing. And so that's why. Uh, scientists like Dr. Rebecca Ledger, or should I say behaviors like Dr. Rebecca Ledger and Claudia Richter and Karen Pryor and um, I don't know who, who, whoever else, all these people who are so focused on treat training dogs, that's why they're only successful upwards at the max of 60% of the dogs, whereas my work is 100% successful. Yeah, it's not like I'm bragging, I'm not. I'm just disappointed that the, 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 the brute force perspective of, hey, let's give a dog food to make them comply is completely counterintuitive to the dog's natural behavior. Nowhere does food exist anywhere in the entire canine species anywhere at all as a communication tool or a reward fee. Food isn't used at all, but you know, you have these R plus positive people and whatever they call these, uh, these, I don't know any of these training things. I never took training classes. I'm a natural gifted person uh, from a gift that God has shared with me. So it's, it's that's why it's, I'm doing it for free. But uh, you know, it makes sense. If you're not using food, uh, if dogs aren't using food themselves to do compliance, why are we the human beings? It's arrogance. It's anthropomorphization. It's this aspect that we think we're doing it. And those of you who have highly reactive, dysfunctional dogs will all say, yeah, my dog, when he gets riled up, he won't take food. He won't take a treat. It's out the window. He's ballistic. He goes to attack me back. Again, this treat training thing comes from Ivan Pavlov back in 1897, 122 years ago when people owned slaves. Women couldn't vote. And that's where Lima from the APDT and all that stuff is relying on this information that they're basing it on. And there's this like on crutches trying to get through. Like I say before, these guys are like uh, these industries are like um, uh, a, a person trying to ride a tricycle with two wheels. It's just it's nonsensical. And the logic process is always coming from the apex perspective. Okay, uh, so the next one here, um, I'm going to go on there. It's not natural for dogs to take food from your mouth without trust, species-specific behavior, resource value and communication, developing familiarity and trust. And then the next section there is, who is Ziva the dog? Anxiety is the result of our lack of acknowledgement. Down training is exactly training down. So uh, I'm going to talk about Ziva in a little bit here. And those of you who kind of followed me yesterday, um, will understand who Ziva is and they'll know who Ziva is and um, uh, just an amazing uh, representation of what we do on an emotionally connective uh, uh, relationship, how we bond. Um, okay, so we're going to do that part and let me just go, uh, what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to talk about, because we'll do the bridges thing at another time because I want to I want to lead people into this part of it so they have, a, you guys all have an understanding of what I'm talking about. So, 
in my cover video on my Facebook page, Arf Arf Bark Bark uh, Rescue Foundation, right, a registered nonprofit, you see on the cover one where it's a video, a uh, 90 second video of Minky the White Jindo. In the beginning, he's, he's a reactive, he's a dog that Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation uh, failed to be able to train over 20,000 plus dogs that they've worked with and they weren't able to figure him out. They've got a, a well-known behaviorist on their board and they've got in Hollywood, I mean, they're in Los Angeles, they know Matt Damon and all this stuff, right? And nobody there, none of the trainers behaviors could help. Nobody in North America could help. So they reach out to me up here in Canada and uh, then they had four months with him. They weren't able to progress and weren't able to figure him out. Obviously food wasn't going to work. He was attacking people without no 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 reason. He, he couldn't be petted. A whole bunch of things that are going on. You can see the information on there. Um, and so yeah, they reach out to me and I, you know, 36 hours later, it's like, well, how did you do this? Right? As the founder, Mark Ching said, uh, as he was quite um, quite pleased, quite impressed. Um, in the in that 90 second cover video, you're gonna see me where I'm feeding uh, food to uh, to to uh, um, Tonka. He's a Harlequin, Harlequin Great Dane, food mouth to mouth. And then same with Minky, who I just talked about earlier, the Jindo, food mouth to mouth. And this is, you know, Minky is a dog who's afraid of men he was born and raised into a metal cage on a dog farm dog meat farm in south korea uh minky you know you, you look at the videos he, he, it's on a wire rusted wire grate so you know they're like uh, almost uh, almost two inches by two inch grate so it's really hard for the dog any dog to any even a human to stand on that um so that's the kind of cruelty that's happening in south korea china uh, these these low educated uh, emotionally uh, stunted individuals that do the cultural torture of dogs because of some arrogant and misguided uh, belief. Um, but okay, so getting back to the thing is Minky is a dog that is afraid of men and Asian men, especially because he, South Korea, right? I'm Asian. Look at, I can see myself in the thing. I'm Asian. I got to, my hair is driving me nuts here again. Um, but I'm Asian. So it makes it, every time I work with a meat dog, a skittish dog, a dog from Formosa, uh, Formosa Mountain Dog, a, a Jindo, or Basenji. A lot of times, these dogs are extremely skittish, and a lot of times, because of these areas that they come from, the education is so low, uh, the dogs are afraid, and they're afraid of men. And coming in from a dog, a dog coming in from Asia, that I deal with these guys, um, it's really difficult because right off the bat, Asian guy. Doesn't matter what I, uh, my voice is different or not, it's Asian, and they're already so. Not only are they already a concerned, period, they're even more concerned because. I look familiar in a very uh, dastardly way. So I have to work with these guys and all that part. So uh, Minky's a dog who will just bite people, right? And when he was at Animal Hope and Wellness Foundation, I think he bit seven people in like two months. <laughs> and there's no reason at all. Like somebody would just be going by his thing and he would just lunge at them and bite them. And, um, you know, I knew all the stuff that when he came out here. And I knew he hadn't been, he's never, he, wouldn't, he couldn't even be petted by the staff. The regular staff couldn't pet him. Nobody could take him out for a walk. He was just completely shut down. Uh, I did a bunch of volunteer stuff there for them. And, um, you know, obviously getting food, taking food from someone's face is going to be extremely dangerous with, with Minky because the trust part where he, if, if you move incorrectly, if I moved incorrectly, he would snap because he would think I would be doing something. Or if I moved my hand, he would think I would be doing something. The other videos that I've shown about Minky is the danger part. So having him take food from my face, from my mouth, is a trust aspect. The Harlequin Tonka um, is the same aspect, but Tonka's different, right? He, he's a 180 plus pound Great Dane, attacked 16 people in New York, dragged a shell to work into his kennel when she went to, uh, uh, she accidentally put her arm in at nighttime to give him a Kong with peanut butter food, and he dragged her in, and uh, I have photos of it. There's blood all over the inside of the kennel. The wound is significant on this person's arm. 42 stitches. Not as bad as uh, wounding as what Nero did to somebody in Alabama before he came to me, where he caught 67 stitches and dragged someone onto the floor. Uh, uh, Nero's uh, extreme resource guarding. Uh, uh, Nero's passed away, uh, my beloved Nero. Um, uh, Tonka, extreme resource guarding. Not just the Kong and all that stuff with the peanut butter. Uh, he was shock collared by he was he had seven different owners by, by the time he was 19 months of age one of the owners there and I, I always kind of like yeah haha ha, there's not really you know you're a piece of garbage but one of these guys uh, and it's always men that are abusive always men I, I don't understand I mean, women are yes and then I've 
you know, I've gone out with women who are kind of abusive myself. I don't know why I'm so stupid, but it's happened, uh, but not that often, thank goodness. But it's usually men that are abusive. And um, one of the owners thought because Tonka had resource guarding, they would use a shock collar on him. And they would train him to not resource guard. So every time he went to food to go eat, they would shock collar him. And they would turn up to 10 because he's 180 plus pound dog. And it hurts like crazy. If anyone's ever tried to shock collar, it freaking hurts even at two. It's like, wah! Right? It's, it's like getting stung like a bee, like I said the other day to Zeus, uh, who was uh, commenting. So the shock collar is on and it's freaking the dog out. It's freaking the dog out. Tonka's, every time he went to go for food, time for treats, anything, they would shock collar him. And he would be quivering and drooling and scared. And he'd be backed up against the corner every time he got shocked. It, 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 he got scared. Every time food was around, he got scared. He got scared. And then when he was returned back to the Southampton Animal Shelter in New York, right, they got deep pockets. When he was returned there, uh, apparently the owner was laughing how he trained Tonka not to have resource guarding. Wow, what a brilliant man, apparently, right? No, this is a moron. It's a moron. It's an arrogant human aspect. It's a, like I say, it's always the men that tend to be stupid and arrogant and, and treat others uh, with such disrespect, right? It takes time to change. You know, I was never the great guy myself. I'm not a great guy. I just, you know, but you got to have some scale of things. So what ended up happening is Tonka got adopted out to the next family who had, a, had somebody there. And Tonka became resource guarding because now he realized I wasn't in this old place where I was getting shocked every time I went near food. Then he became significantly dangerously guarded with his food. So that when somebody went by, accidentally, he attacked the person, as a child, attacked the person, and that person, child, required plastic surgery. Nobody could get near him especially with food, the guarding, and then he it was like that with toys. Anything that was of value, that was personification, anything that brought him joy or, co or comfort, Tonka would attack. I get these dogs here. And we're talking about a dog that has a 700 PSI bite strength, 180 plus pounds, 6 feet 4 inches, over 6 feet 4 inches standing height. His head was, uh, his head is like three times bigger than mine. And what ends up happening is that resource guarding is trained and trained and trained and trained. So that means if even when I would feed Tonka a treat or let him lick off, one time I was, you know, a number of times I let him lick off the plate in the beginning and he'd be licking off the plate. And as he would just start to lick, he would immediately go and bite my hand. And I'd drop the plate, plate fall to the ground. Thankfully, it didn't break because uh, I have that cheap corningware stuff so it would fall to the ground and he would grab me and he would shake me and um, he didn't break my hands uh, but he really hurt it quite a bit often and then the next time you know five seconds later here you go again right because I gotta pretend that it didn't hurt me and it's freaking hurting me like crazy right like I've said I've been bitten I can't even close my hand properly um, you know so it would do it again and again and all that stuff, but he was significantly resource guarding in the beginning, just extremely dangerous, just extremely dangerous. And it's tough because I'm five foot 11, top of his head comes up right here, right at my chest level. So it's not like a lab or a little pit bull, you know, a small dog that they're okay, whatever, you can kind of keep him away. We're talking about a dog, not only it's the same, almost the same height as me on just standing on his regular fours, but that has the ability and the power to predaciously come after me. Like I say, predatory dogs, they don't chase you. They're that smart. They don't need to chase you. They just walk towards you. Like I said to people before, is you know, if who have siblings, you ever have a fight with your sibling, you're so angry at them, but you've gone beyond angry and that you just want to kill them. You don't chase them throughout the house anymore. You just walk after them because you know there's nowhere they can hide. And they see that look in your face. And what do your sibling do? They run like crazy. Because they haven't seen that type of predator inside of you before. And they leave. And they know. And they learn. So that's what it's like working with Minky, uh, with, with Tonka, with Walter, right? <laughs> with Tonka in that sense of it. That type of uh, drive. That type of resource guarding is extremely significant. 
So with Minky, I had to establish trust through my physical conduct. With Tonka, the same thing. I had to establish trust through my physical contact and conduct with him and how I worked with him and how I touched him. Uh, same with Minky. So Tonka and Minky, two different types. One predatorial, significant danger. The other one, hey, Jamie. The other one, Minky, skittish, afraid. So one suspicious, the other one paranoid. So these type of two psychological behaviors, how do you deal with them? Trust. Now, everything that I'm talking about here, and I say it in the disclaimer, do not try to do anything that I'm doing that will put you at risk. If you think you're going to be at risk, if you think there's even the slightest danger, hey Chuck, if you think the slightest danger of you being attacked or bitten or even nipped, don't do it. Stop. Don't do it at all. Don't try to follow through with what I'm talking about. Because you not may, you have a very strong possibility of being killed. And it's not an embellishment. So don't take these risks if you think even in the 1% that you can be hurt, attacked, or killed. Um, okay, so I'm going to go back to that after that legal disclaimer, right? You don't have to do legal disclaimer. Um, so the situations that would happen... Uh, for example, with Minky is because he'd been uh, choked uh, being, you know, a meat dog and they would choke him, try to strangle these dogs uh, out of this stupid misguided belief that the, the pain and torture made the dog feel uh, meat taste better and kept all the adrenaline in the blood and inside the meat before they horrifically killed him. So uh, Minky, for one thing, wasn't familiar with food. He had no idea about regular food in those Korean and other you know China and all and Thai, Thailand and all these places they don't feed the dog food the the water is rotten the water's got gunk in it bacteria thick as as as, as like like probably an eighth of an inch if not it's disgusting the dogs are just eating literally garbage the garbage is coming that's old and moldy garbage, uh, dumpster garbage that's coming through from the restaurants in the back alleys in, in Asia there are being fed to the dogs. When Mickey came here, he would start tearing apart plastic bags, shopping bags, thinking there was food in it. That's how sad it is. You know, it, it's really tough. Even uh, Nero, um, you can tell the behavior of how a dog has been treated by the way they react to how we do it, and then we extrapolate or destructure it backwards. Um, or destructure it backwards, that's an oxymoron, sorry. Uh, so what we do, we, we figure out the aspects of why the dog's behavior is, like for example, a lot of times, uh, abusive people, um, they will beat the dog, their dog, and the dog runs away afraid, and then they try to entice the dog with food again. Treats. So that's why I don't keep treats. Is this, uh, why create a memory path that's not necessary, even though it doesn't make any sense in real science, not this stupid science that these behaviors are all relying on, that they have no idea what they're talking about. So uh, they'll give the dog treats to bring the dog back again, and then the guy flips out again and starts beating the dog again. And then the dog goes, holy cow. And of course, the dog associates food with pain and abuse and so forth like that. Resource guarding. You see that whole part that all follows in there? And uh, like Nero, for example, I would give him treats, uh, you know, I, I, they're not, well, it's snacks, right? So the, I, I call it snacks, but I'm saying treats so that makes everyone understand. So I give them, give them uh, I'll just use snacks, okay? So I give them snacks for no reason whatsoever. I know, Rita. <laughs> so, so give them snacks, just, you know, out of the blue. Yeah, okay, today, oh, they come up to me, they're a little lonely, a little hungry, whatever, I just give them a snack, like a dog biscuit or whatever, something, you know, something healthy. Um, you know, a couple of my, my Danes here, they... <laughs> They'll eat like apples and, and peaches. Uh, oh yeah, uh, if you feed anything like apples, peaches with seeds, you know, take the seeds out, take the green stems out, same with tomatoes and all stuff, the green stems, because it can trace, trace amounts of cyanide are in there. And you know, it's a trace amount, but hey, why take the risk? Um, so even with Nero, for example, uh, I remember I would give him treats, he was fine, within reason, he was always cautious about it. And one time I had some uh, wet dog food that was donated to my rescue foundation. I gave him the can to lick out of because I would put it in the bowl and everything for everybody and split it all up as a, as a dessert topping treat and I would give it to Nero and he immediately cowered and hit his head, right? And so right then you go, okay, so that guy's created a valuation of treats to entice the dog after they've beaten the dog 
and then bring up a higher value treat and higher value treat, right? And it's not higher value. I mean, the higher value, ugh, so dumb, these phrases, higher value. All this talk that these scientists are saying, value and that I trigger second on. It's like, it's favorites. I have a favorite, you know, when I was a kid, my favorite uh, dessert was Black Forest cake. That was my favorite dessert. Now it's probably something else, you know, like just chocolate, dark chocolate, right? But it's my favorites. And if I was to, you know, you remember when you were kids and you did trick or treating, right? Trick or treating just around the corner here. What did you do with your treats? What did you do with your chocolate? You put them in order of what you liked and you saved the best ones for last. Right? We, we didn't call it high value. We called them our favorites or our most favorites. We hid those somewhere else so that we would leave out the decoys for our the rest of our kids, our, our siblings, right? Because I come from a family of eight. So we'd leave it out somewhere else so that they would eat those. And then we saw, I still had my favorites somewhere. So it's not, that's why I say, when we start talking about dogs as if they're just dumb animals, then we have the scientists like Ian Dunbar, who is our PhD, people who have no idea what they're talking about and the dogs are being killed. But we start talking about dogs with an actual sentience and a, and a relative sentient, right? An emotional context of things. Then we go, oh, okay, that's right. It's just my dog's favorite. He has favorites. Then we have more of a connection, right? Like I said to you, Jamie, the other day, um, yesterday. <laughs> okay, so uh, with Nero, he would cower and all that stuff. So, you, so that's what the uh, idea, and it's heartbreaking to see that with uh, with Tonka. Uh, he would just he would attack me. He would li even while he was looking, because he was partially blind from being beaten and part and uh, hearing impaired and a little bit of brain damage. He would just just looking, and all of a sudden he would go after me. I know why. I'll explain that as we go down my journey path here, uh, as I uh, share everything that I've learned in my life. Um, so that's all these things that happen. With Mickey, same thing. So with Mickey, it's one part of getting the trust because he'd been choked and, and, and strangled by the, the meat dog farmer there. <laughs> Stuff like that. And so I have to be cautious because if I get near towards his face, is he going to attack me? Or is he not going to attack me as per se, but is he going to react out of fear and paranoia and bite me so that he doesn't get hurt himself, right? The redundancy of it. Anyways, okay. So that's what ends up happening as well. With Minky, I have to approach him in a certain way so he learns to get trust from me. With Tonka, I knew he's resource guarding. I saw the photos, as I said. The wound was, was horrific and it's still gross. Blood's everywhere inside the kennel from this shelter worker who put a Kong with peanut butter inside his kennel at night. <laughs> On Tonka's, knowing that Tonka had been shocked, collared so badly, he was quivering, drooling, and then the next time he's out there, he attacks a child who walked by his food dish, right? Inflicting wounds requiring plastic surgery. I know these things. And I know the fact that all seven of those families that he went through aside from one person garrett who was an amazing person for for tonka but was this too much for him the other six were all men that all beat him they all hit him they all did different things one guy was caught on video uh, at the shelter returning tonka when he's about eight nine months of age dragging him back and he's about probably 100 120 pounds at that time because he's a big boy pounding him on video, in the head, super hard, which they suspect he's the one that caused him to be partially blind and, and partially deaf. And then when he brought him back in, because the animal welfare laws are so lax, his explanation, this, this loser owner's explanation was, well, he tried to attack me. So it's justified abuse, right? We did that to our, if our spouse did that to us, we would have the police involved. And they would be in the crowbar hotel. And they'd have a, they'd have, you know, <laughs> they would hopefully learn so with Tonka was that part as well so two different var variations of it but how did I get both of them in that video too you see not only am I each of them and it's and it's in the same day actually of that video on top of that how did I get both of them when I'm towards the end of that 90 second cover where I have them both beside me and I'm giving hugs to to, to, to Tonka I'm giving hugs to, to Minky right to the face at that time it's trust Okay, so how do we build this trust aspect? One thing we have to remember, first and foremost, which, again, counters everything these silly scientists and behaviors and, and professors and PhDs are saying about food, because it doesn't exist as a communication device. Nowhere. 
right? We're just like we're like the we're like the like you know it was a Doonesbury cartoon, right? Gary Trudeau Doonesbury cartoon, or or one of the cartoons where there's that kid that's got his head trying to push the door, and the door says pull, and he's pushing, right? Or or the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, and getting the same result. Treat training, trying to treat training a dangerous dog, and the dogs aren't responding, and you keep trying to give treats, and then what do you say? Oh, the dog's broken. Let's kill it. Trust is the basis of how I'm able to get Tonka, to get Minky, other dogs to do so, to be able to take treats from my face, from my mouth. It's trust. Because the one thing we have to remember that totally blows away everything. Everything. It blows everything away from the, 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 the silly uh, uh, academics perspective or opinions or white papers in regards to the treat training aspect. That's... Nowhere is the activity. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. Okay, I was like, ah. Nowhere does the activity of giving food to another dog, to another canine, occur naturally in the species. You might have the anomaly, and anom, 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 So you might have that one little, you know, oh, rare aspect that maybe because of the friendliness between the dogs. But are you going to see a wolf take food from another wolf's mouth? What will happen? The wolf is going to attack. Resource guarding. Wild stray dogs, whatever. What are they going to do? They're going to attack each other. You know, maybe it's a mother pup, mother and pup, and bring the food, of course, right? You've seen the dogs bury the bones. There's a reason why a dog buries the bone. It can also be an, uh, an aspect of uh, uh, insecurity, unsecurity, uh, uh, especially if they're at home. So that's a different talk, right? So again, nowhere... In the entire canine species, the domesticated dog genus, as I label it, nowhere, hyenas, nowhere, is food being taken out of the mouth of another dog, another canine, another hyena, another wolf. None. It doesn't occur. Good, they're putting those people in prison. They're disgusting. Um, so nowhere does that happen, right? Resource guarding is significant in the wild, especially. It's trust. It's trust that our dog understands that we're not taking the food away from them. It's trust that our dog understands that we're taking care of them, right? It's somewhat similar to like a mother pup taking care of their, uh, their, the, her, her babies, her puppies, and that sense of nurturing the, and the, and the, and the um, uh, drinking from the nipples and all that stuff and the cleaning all, all that, that codependency aspect of it. But it doesn't occur. So you have to build, we, I, have to build trust with these predators. And that trust has to happen from the way I touch, the way I talk to them, the way I give them the treats. I'm not trying to trick. I don't. I don't pretend to throw treats at dogs. You know, that's the other thing. You see people throw treats up in the air at their dog, and they go, "Oh, now my dog's all nippy and snappy." And that's another reason why, because then we end up training the dog to be nippy and snappy at food. And then we go, "Well, why did the dog just bite us now?" Duh. <sighs> right? It's so. It's so silly, hey, Michael. I mean, Debbie. Um, so it, it really is that point. It's a trust aspect, and we have to build that trust with our dog. And like I said, I'm talking about a topic that can potentially cause someone to be bitten in the face. So I am saying do not do what I'm saying. I'm talking about my own personal experience. Do not attempt to recreate this whatsoever. I don't care if your dog is a happy super dog and would never bite you and never has. My personal experience, my legal liability disclaimer, do not do anything that I'm talking about. When I start working with these guys with the food in my mouth, I start with the treat and I obviously, through time, start graduating closer and closer to my face. And that is extremely dangerous. Because as the closer they get, because they're already hand shy. The dogs I bring in, they're all abused. They're already hand shy. They're already afraid of this fist. They're already afraid of this hand. You've been around a dog that's been abused and you move your hand a little too quickly, they, they freak out or they go to attack you. These dogs don't freak out and run away. They come at you. They come at me. So I start training them as I bring them closer and closer and closer to my face. And I can tell you, it's freaking scary. Because Minky's biting a couple of times in the face. Yeah, okay, whatever. Like Nero, who, who was... Uh, uh, 80 pounds light. Oh, sorry. Uh, seven, well, he was about 105 when he died. Um, so he was about 80 pounds lighter than 
than, than Walter. So Nero was only 30 inches at the withers. So he's only, he was a very short, small dog, small Dane for you who, of us who have Danes, whereas Walter was one of the giant dogs at 38 inches at the withers. And he was, like I say, I'm 5'11", he towered over me. You can see the photos in there. So Nero once grabbed me by the top of the head and got both temples at the same time, causing it to bleed. Walter can completely engulf my entire head in his mouth, if he chose to do so. I have given I feed raw, so I give them, I, I've given him raw chicken carcasses, and these are chicken carcasses, and he, it's all gone, you can't even see it in his mouth. Anybody with a Dana Mastiff large dog, you'll, you'll say, yeah, you give him a bone, but you can't even see it in their face. So as I work on that, I realize that sudden movements will cause, may cause, Walter to attack my face. Because he's already done it. It's a proven record that he's already attacked a child and, and that child required plastic surgery. He's already attacked his shelter worker, dragged her into his kennel. And now he did just drag her and he, he attacked her till they could get him off. So when I'm working with these guys, it's based on that trust. I can only do so much and create a stability of my hand motion with them. So that he understands reliability. That's why we don't dart all of it. And when I talk to my clients, I talk about holding their hands still in a certain format that instills trust in their dogs. So that their dogs can understand that there's not a uh, freakiness to my behavior or to their behavior. And that they start to rely on the, that solidness. Just again, like I talk about the leash aspect, the leash manners. And you want to make sure that you're always having a six foot leash and not spaghettiing it up in your hand. And you're, it's like cruise control on the highway. Speed limit's 80 or 60. And uh, I mean like here, 80, 80 kilometers in Canada, uh, 60, uh, so we say 60 miles. So the speed limit's 60 miles an hour and the guy's doing 50 miles and then 75 and 55 and 65 and 60. And eventually like, dude, just keep it on cruise control here because you're driving me nuts with the speed difference. Same thing with our hand motion, consistency, trust, right? You, you're going to go, if you're going to go on a drive somewhere where there's a lot of traffic and risky roads, you're going to let the person that you can trust drive versus the person who is never even paying attention to things and always looking around and is on their cell phone and all of a sudden you're like, well, dude, pay attention to the road. You're going to kill us. It's just trust aspect. So, and I won't get to the specifics of training because like I said, this is something that I just don't want anybody and I have trainers behaviors who follow me. I don't want anyone trying something where they do get bitten in the face and then that's just going to be really bad. So don't do anything that I'm saying in regards to that. I won't go into too much detail. I will down the road. Once things are established and people understand where I where I talk and how to present and, and roll things. So so again, it's not natural for dogs to take food out, out of our mouth. So why are they doing it? Because they trust us. We've taught them the behavior, of course, by bringing it in and so forth. But we've taught them, but it's not a natural species specific behavior. It doesn't occur. So it's a it's a human it's a cohabitative aspect that we've created for our dogs to follow through. So what do we do then? We allow them to understand that what our behavior and what their behavior and their understanding, what our understanding is, makes sense that it's encouraged. And that if they're kind of nervous, that they know that they're safe, that we're not going to be erratic in our behavior, that we're not going to make them feel like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I can't trust this person. I knew you were going to be uh, sketchy and because I knew you weren't going to be trustworthy, I can't trust anything you're doing now. And that food that's in, you're trying to get to your mouth, uh, what are you going to do with your hands? What, 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 why did you move your shoulders all of a sudden? Even if you're like, oh, I'm, I'm comfortable and I got to move around a bit. What are you doing there? These are the behaviors that we work with, that I work with, with these predators and, and these extremely skittish dogs to let them understand. And there's a certain consistency and it's tiny, 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 tiny baby steps. Like we're talking super duper tiny. The dog is processing at a tenth of a second. And if we were to put that on a distance length scale, it would be one, one ten thousandth of that. That really tiny thing. And that's why we have to have patience when we work through on it. Right. And the other aspect, like I talk about resource value and communication, the dog has favorites, just like we have favorites. You ever give a dog two different treats and then they decide to choose one? Or you give them two different bones, so you have them and they, what do they, and they pick one? And it's not like they're left-handed and right-handed dogs. See, that's what I say. They know their sides. They decide which one they like better because of either the way it smells or the value, right? That value, the favorite part of it that they like, that they're in tune with, right? and they'll eat it. 
I mean, I saw a video of uh, 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 one of the groups where there's these two dogs, uh, two breeds, uh, you know, I, it's uh, Great Danes, and they're eating romaine lettuce. I'm like, holy cow, it's, it's so cute. It's adorable, but none of these guys will eat it here because they're used to meat, of course, but they won't eat it here. So it's a value, and it's how we create that trust, right? So what they find is valuable. So when I work with a dog in regards to value, in regards to uh, um, building trust, and the reason why I bring them in close to the face is so that they can trust me, so that if I am close to the face in the future, for whatever reason, they understand that my behavior is not negative. How many times will this happen to a dog's life, in a dog's life, and especially with an abusive person, even a person you're not trying to be abusive, and I've done it myself, is where you're just facing your dog and you're staring at them, you're going, bad dog, you're blah, 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 right? And, you're, and, right? and the dog's like, holy cow, that face is really close and it scares me. So it's the trust aspect, right? Um, so we want to develop familiarity and trust with our dogs by just being patient. And when you're trying to train them to be able to take things, if you have a great dog that you won't get bitten in the face with, that won't be reactive to you, just the, you know, the the sixty percent whatever the good dogs and all that stuff you just want to have some patience with them and they're not taking things they don't understand right because how many times you get them you're like okay come out here here the food's right here right you, I I do a vlog about uh, why dogs you know the, they talk about dogs follow your fingers when you point that's what scientists say I'm like no those scientists are idiots they're incorrect dogs not following your finger naturally. Your dogs learn that from our own sub, sub uh, our own subtle movements of all the time. Because how many times have we the dog is standing there and you know while we're making food at the kitchen and we drop something or we're going to feed the dog something a, a snack right a treat and maybe it's a, a cookie and the cookie is broken in a piece like that and we feed him and that and the, and we and he eats the he uh, Zevia eats the treat right and she eats it and she's like oh this is yummy but then there's that little piece that we ourselves see that had dropped to the ground. What do we do? We point down to the ground, and what does our dog do? What, 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 what? What's your hand doing? There's no food in there. They don't look at the ground. So how do we get them to go down the ground? We get them to follow our finger. We don't go and take the other hand. And go, whoa, we're gonna look at that. Subconsciously, we've done that, and we've got them to follow it down. And if not, we tap on the ground. We bring the sound to them, right? That's an arrogance of humanity, thinking that dogs know how to follow finger pointing. You bring in the dog from the wild. Or you bring in a dog like Tonka, in here. He has no idea what finger pointing means. Zero idea. So this is the the aspect of science that just happens to lose itself. You know, if I was to give a treat to Zevia and uh, and she's there waiting for me, and I, you know how many times I've right we've pretended to give a treat to our dog, and they're like, mm, what's going on, right? They have this logical process of analyzing the size. They see the shape, right? It's through the field of vision processing. They have the ability to do so. And if we gave the dog a treat, just watch this. And I'll explain this at another future time when I remember this because I'm like over an hour again. When we're giving them a fake nothing and we do it a couple of times, what does your dog do? Your dog looks at you, then they look to the ground to see if it fell down. It's just putting two and two together, folks. It's taking our brains away from this arrogance of the people at the top of the food chain in the dog training industry and going you know what why don't we respect the dogs brilliance why don't we do that instead and that's what i mean i had to otherwise i would be uh viciously killed it's just it's, it's so scary to be attacked by a giant dog that moves your entire body in their mouth and it, and it is and then you have to pretend you weren't upset um, anyone who's worked with me have seen that right I got bitten the other day uh, on the side of the leg um, um, with a with a, a Formosan actually I think it's a from yeah Formosan right I just got bitten on the side of the leg and I was like well whatever who cares right I mean it's, it hurts but what are you gonna do right look at the cops right you know I've talked about how uh, police uh, paramedics, firefighters, uh, these guys, you guys do these amazing job. I mean, you're just going like, okay, I'm going to go in and I might be killed today. Wow. How many people say that, right? How many people do you know? I'm going to go to Starbucks today and I'm going to get killed today. Right? So, so you just deal with things when it happens. 
Um, I want to talk about Zevia. I just started talking about Zevia yesterday. I think yesterday or the day before, right? And um, I talk about Zevia. And I'll show you what Z who Zevia is, right? Because um, Zevia is is a dog I'm going to start using as I move forward on this. Just so you understand what it means to have emotional context. So uh, let me just go uh, get Zevia here, okay? So this is Zevia. So it's reverse. Z-E-V-I-A. Zevia. It's a uh, can of pop. But when I was talking about Zevia yesterday, when I was talking about her yesterday, I didn't know it was a male or female. Then I said, yeah, it sounds like a female's name. Then I started Zevia this, Zevia that, and all that stuff. So I started creating a, an emotional connection, an emotional franchisement with Zevia, the name. But in my head, I was already creating a picture and an and existence. Uh, when Miki is here with the other other Danes who are significant resource guarders, and that uh, Miki has a raw beef bone, and he starts growling, and the other two are there, I, you notice when I'm talking to you guys, I'm talking to you guys, and when I switch over to Miki, I'm 100% on Miki. And I'm talking to him full emotional context. Stop it, Miki. And then he, and I talk them down, just like the dogs barking out the window, etc. So that's who Zevia is, and that's just who Zevia is going to be. And the reason also is because all the dogs know their names. You know, the scientists say the dogs don't know their names. They're just learning the sounds of it, and they think it is, and they're putting it... In. Like, why, they, why are scientists insulting all of us dog lovers? We know our dogs know their names. And in fact, what is language? Language is intonation. Language is a sound. Like the dog barking. I've talked about dogs barking out the window. I've talked about wolves howling. You can hear it. Those of you who know your dog so well, you can hear when they're starting to bark and whine or cry in the tone of their voice. You can tell. So when I talk about the other dogs here, I don't use their names anymore because they used to come, oh, well, you said my name, right? Because every time it's associated with something. So now it's Zevia. So now when I talk about Zevia, 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 Zevia. And Zevia is a female. And so... When we move forward, be like, oh, I can't wait to meet Zevia. Like, no, well, you know, you just go to the, just go to Costco and get Zevia. You get like four hundred cans of Zevia. Um, so that, that's the thing. Um, and then what is it? Anxiety is a result of our lack of acknowledgement. And I talk about that in regards to yesterday or the other day, two days ago, in regards to why do dogs jump at us? Right? We come home, they're jumping on us, and you see the article, uh, the vlog that I did, and they're jumping at us and everything. And I'll get to that in a few seconds here. Uh, a couple of minutes probably and then the next one is down training is exactly training down i call it down training and people are i've had you know the trainers like there's no such word as down training that's that doesn't even make sense okay so when you teach somebody how to do something you're training them right you're getting them to learn a, a, a human or whatever you learn, getting them to learn a behavior so that they go to school what do you do you learn you train yourself higher education you train yourself a dog becomes active or learns tricks they're like that. When they have dysfunctions and the dysfunctions are high up and they're like, mm, whatever. And then we get the dog not to be like, yes, but like, ah, uh, later on. So they're up like that. Where, where, where did they go from up here? Down. We down train our dog. And when we think of these human terms of down training, these words, that's why I always use conversation in all my topics. When we talk about down training the dog, then we know what we're actually doing. We actually, in our own subconscious, we've created a plan of conduct and our own behavior and what we want to achieve with our dog together. We down train our dog. So that's the term down training. I'll get into that later on. I talk about, uh, you know, uh, uh, training methods of what I call in motion training, you know, active training, passive training, all this kind of stuff. We'll get to that later on as we, as we go there. Uh, anxiety is the result of our lack of acknowledgement. When I talk about that, is regards to learning and improving less. Yeah, oh, yeah, we just talked yesterday. In eighteen, in less than eighteen hours, Daxon's already made a, a significant change, right? And you see the things that I talk about. I talk at uh, Jamie on a visceral aspect and the psychological aspect of Daxton and where he actually belonged as him. He's a little brother that feels like he has to do everything. He's taking care of everything. He just wants to be off the clock once in a while. And he needs you guys to take care of things, right? You have the, the kids running through the home and all that stuff and all these things. He, he's got to realize, hey, you know what? 
mom's got it now. Dad's got it. Now you'll start to see, and Chuck is probably going to be angry with me now because now they're not going to be hanging out with you as much. And it'll be like, when you go somewhere, they'll be like, why are they going with you now, honey? <laughs> you're like, oh, you're not too bad. Mom's got it. Um, that part. And I talked to the same thing in regards to Winston, the, your lab that you sent the picture. You can see in his body behavior and his way he holds himself that there are certain suppressed feelings inside of him. And he has lost his self-esteem as well, Jamie. So when we start working on the seniority, and I posted that thing about seniority, and about dogs going pee and all that stuff. Like I say, look through my vlogs. Watch my vlogs, you know, podcasted or whatever. I don't know. Uh, some Actually, uh, Hoagie's, uh, uh, Hoagie's dad, uh, Matt Chun, who I did that live thing the other day, uh, he's contacted me and said, yeah, I want to help you kind of get your social media thing, at least figure out how to do screen sharing so I can go over these things live with people. And this is my ultimate goal, right? I have a fundraiser to help give, uh, you know, uh, you know, for donations, all that money goes towards paying for people on fixed incomes to have sessions. I, 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 I put out probably the equivalent of about six to seven, sometimes $8,000 worth of pro bono advice to up to three dozen different rescue organizations and vlogs now and everything like that. And I do that every month um, because just, like I said, I believe in God. So this is what we want to do. We want to share and, and help. Right. Um, but that, that, that whole part of it, all these things that we address with Winston, you'll see the dynamic of your family make a shift. Like I said, right, the timeline said four and a half days. You'll see the shift happen. My timelines are really good as long as people are, are really... Yeah, Winston has been more engaging with me today since we started your recommendations. You know, Jamie, I, I I just love the fact that you just went, yeah, okay, makes sense. And you embraced it, right? And same with Melanie, and I'm going to get to uh, uh, Christy, uh, Christy Lee, Melanie Hatfield, uh, you know, a few other people. Um, it just, it's just because I'm just applying the things that just make sense to me, and I had no choice but to really survive. Um, that's why I say I can read a dog at two-tenths of a second. That's why when I make a big laugh at it, when you see these uh, dog training groups and these reactive dog groups, and the mandate is it's impossible to train a dog that's aggressive without ever having met the dog. Right, look at here, Jamie, Melanie, all these, right? You know, you look on my uh, arf, arf, bark, bark .com under the tab, free help for your dog. Join my group, you post it up, you get free help. You get free down training help that would cost you three to $600. It's done for free. I just ask people to subscribe to my YouTube channel, follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and, and Facebook. That's It's not much, but a lot of these people who I've asked them to don't even do it, so now I'm going to be a jerk about it, unfortunately. I have to be. It's like, I'm not asking you for much. And then they start following me, and then they unfollow me. Right, so it hurts because it's like, uh, anyways. All right, so long story short, um, it's so it's very easy to be able to help people over the uh, over that, right? Like I, like I was saying to Kim, right? Kim, you were watching yesterday uh, with Blossom. I, I said to you about letting me see the picture. Thank you, Jamie. I, I let me see the picture of your dogs, right? I said the same thing to you, Jamie. Dachshunds like this, and 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 uh, uh, why it is like that, right? Your double merle is like that and and Winston's going to be like this so you need to make this adjustment for Winston you said yesterday I think you said well no Winston seems like he's okay cool I'm like no there's something else right because for me it's the whole family so I said to Kim yesterday about Blossom show me a photo and she said why do you want to see a photo and I said because then I get to see who you saw who you fell in love with and I said did you see other photos before of other dogs and she said yeah well, at least a hundred or whatever you said right I said, exactly. You picked that one, that one dog that spoke to your heart. That's what I see. I fall in love with your dogs. I have to. Is How am I going to help someone heal? Right? You see somebody on the street. What is it? Your compassion goes out there to help them. It's the same part with dogs. They can't have the articulation in their voice to show anything. The, the, the pawing and all these other aspects. Like All the vlogs are like this. Um, okay, so... Um, Okay, so the anxiety is, uh, I, I got to get folks on it because I, I know I'm going to run out of time and everything. Um, what was really cool was, and I'm just going to pull up these other windows here. Um, what was really cool is uh, getting feedback. And um, one of them is from uh, one of the first people who, who, who was like, yeah, I'll just give this James guy, you know, a try. It's free. I'm not going to have to do anything. 
Blossom is really mellow today after yesterday. You see, yeah, give and just keep it up, right? Just follow that love, protect her like you're her parent. Do the things I told you. Reset her the way I told you. Hug her the way I told you. Yeah, you're welcome, right? Because, I mean, I'm worried about Winston. You, you humans, I don't really care too much about, right? It's the dogs, right? And then when the dogs are, you know, like, I'm kidding. You know, the thing I talk about is some a couple that has reactive dogs or issues or dysfunctions or skittish, whatever. When they go out for a walk, they they get choked at each other. They start arguing with each other. Or even if they don't argue, they get home, they still have that tension in them, right? Because they're dealing with these things. And then they go off somewhere else, and then and they're like, and they have that little animosity that happens uh, subtle. But then when they start feeling better and like, oh, happier, you see, you see they start holding hands and they're like kind of happy. And they start joking around with each other because they're like, oh, wow, there is light at the end of the tunnel. So that's that's the importance, right? Um, okay, so Melanie had contacted uh, me back August 5th. And put the post up on my page. And like I said, I'm doing the vlog instead of doing the writing it back. Because it's way better that I... Like, I couldn't tell you all this stuff, Kim. Or, or I mean, not Kim. Uh, well, I mean, Kim right, in person. But Jamie, I couldn't tell you all this stuff. Uh, by typing it out, you'd never get all of it. And it would take me three or four novels to tell you all this stuff. Because, you know, I love talking. Um, oh, I, I'm so, I just love what I do here. Right? It's a gift. Um, so, uh, one of the things Melanie had talked about was, uh, one of her old B English bulldogs, uh, Ruby, eight years old and another dog, they kind of fight with each other and, and, and they have issues and, you know, she's highly reactive on walks and will go after our other dog and has anxiety issues. Anyways, if you're in the closed group, you can read it back at August 5th. Uh, we tried clicker training, every harness known, uh, to man, positive reinforcement, negative consequences, nothing has worked. Ruby is currently on Prozac as our other dog is trying to have hip issues and fights simply cannot happen. Although we are more aware, aware we, we clearly, haven't, clearly haven't found a solution. She's sound reactive to most everything, fireworks, loud noises, mailman. There's a video of, uh, of, of Ruby barking at an airplane, <laughs> right? So all these kinds of things walk to, walk to you through Melanie and all this stuff. And um, so... Uh, what was uh, what was kind of cool today was uh, Melanie did a follow up on the uh, when I talk about why dogs jump at you right when we come into the house and they start jumping all over us yesterday you know that uh, the vlog the two days ago whatever it was uh, they start jumping on how do we down train them and I said this is all this is how simple it is to get their anxiety down and that's gonna save people several hundred dollars everybody who's watching this you're gonna save a couple hundred dollars from that episode of Oh, that's all I have to do is basketball, palm them down, and bring them down, and then feed and address and let them know that they're safe through this codependency aspect. Just watch the video. You see? So Melanie said today, and she posted, and, and, and so I really appreciate the feedback that I get because, uh, you know, I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I feel like I'm just talking to myself, even though I know I'm not I'm getting feedback. But it's like I don't know what happens because I always worry about people's dogs. Um, so Melanie says, so I listened to this. And this is my Stopping Your Dog From Jumping On You, October 15th, 2019, episode 21. So Blackjack, right? Episode 21. So I listened to this on my way home and I applied it immediately when I got home. Instant difference. No jumping, no pushing, just some shaking and puffing, which is a, a psychosomatic aspect of a dependency issue, which is, again, like I said, I, I see these little tiny things. Um, some shaking and puffing. Added bonus, when I greeted my other dog, Ruby did not even go after her or even try to jump and attack her. And that's it. That's all. It was dealt like that. Not even a session. Just reading the advice that happens with all the dogs and everything like that. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so you see that? It just worked with Melanie's dog, who Ruby would would bark at the, at the airplanes. Ruby would go and attack her other dog for no reason while there was like all these aspects that are creating that dysfunction within the home. You kind of talk about that, Jamie, about with uh, with um, with Daxon and Y, right? Daxon would attack White for no reason because he's tired of being on the clock all the time. So, um, uh, okay, so we, we got that part. And then let's. I'm just going to switch to two more and then I'm going to finish this off. Um, oh, and actually, Jamie, right? You like you said on, and so what Jamie said yesterday. I mean today, about an hour ago, two hours ago, she said, uh, Jamie, you said, um, uh, I haven't watched this video yet. However, the kids, Chuck and I, have started using your recommended your recommended strategies with all three dogs, and Daxon is showing a bit of improvement already. And what you just said in this vlog here, uh, in your comments, 
He's already shown a difference in 18 hours. And then Winston's making a difference. And you're going to see that. And you're going to see the family. Your family is becoming a family. And that's what the gorgeousness of our heart is and our souls are. And it's what we're asked to do. Only about 10 growls. How many growls normally? Like you said, it was like dozens a day and all that stuff. And then you just keep talking him down. You keep doing what you said. I won't tell you anything else. Like I said, it's baby steps. And, um, you know, we, we teach a person how to fish. And when they learn how to fish, you learn your intuition. You start to trust yourself. You start to see things. And when I give you the little bit of that key on how to recognize these things, then you go off and go, oh, you know what? Maybe this happens because this happened and this made sense. And that happens. And it builds up and then you become empowered and you learn the intuitive aspects. And then when you see other people's dogs, you start noticing these things too. 25 to 30 days, so a third of his reactivity, his behavior, and his discomfort and all of that. Yeah. And don't slack off, right? Practice, 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 consistency, and vigilance. That's it. Right? So, like I say, when I do a phone or video consult, I charge $140 US an hour. So this is, like I say, and, and when I give people, like Kim, you can say the same thing. Uh, anybody who's worked with me, they're, they're in person with a session, they're like, this is more information than I can even expect. And, and, and I think somebody said, like, it would take even five sessions, I wouldn't know how much, like, I would never get this kind of information from the so-and-so master dog trainer in town here. <laughs> but it's because I see all these things and I have to help. Not that I need to or I want to, I just have to. I can't let a dog stay in dysfunction. It's it's so painful and it's, it's hurtful and it, and it kills me inside because the dogs are the innocent victims, right? It doesn't matter. You didn't do anything wrong. It's just to me the do for the, your dog, right? Daxon and Winston and and um uh, um um why is the fact that they're just kind of like they don't know what to do, and they're not they don't become fully evolved. They don't become mature, right? Your dogs don't... Oh, thank you, Kim. Yeah, I know. I love it, right? And you just were like, yeah, I saw the videos. And then so it makes it easier for me to talk to you about it. Because you're like, yeah, yeah, I heard you talking about this. See, same with this couple, uh, this family today, right? I, you know, I saw their dog and mom did an amazing thing like in seconds. And it's great because I wasn't trying to explain everything because the people who have hired me have watched my vlogs. And they're like, okay, cool. The guy knows what he's talking about on these vlogs and he's reading these uh, comments and people are uh, saying it's all working. Like, it's right? Every single person that I've talked to, it's worked with them 100%. I'm your teacher. You're the student. But my fantasy, my life, my dream, my, 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 my fantasy after I'm gone or even before I'm gone is to have more people who are doing what I'm doing but better than me. And it's very much possible. That's why there's not just one great football player. Right? It's not just one football player that's great. There's dozens if not hundreds that we could all talk about. And undiscovered ones. Right? You talk about the person. You see these stories where the the kid is in, living in an impoverished neighborhood. And then somehow, somehow become like a Harvard graduate. Right? We all... I'm not the only person. I just happen to be the one who... Well, you know what? Just give me this dog that's going to kill me. Right? I, I laugh at it because, you know, the journey that I've gone through is just amazing. Like, it's a blessing from God that I'm still alive. Because uh, some of the stuff that they've done is, um, uh, it, it, it's very scary. I've lost relationships over this. I've lost friends over this because they just didn't want to be around me. Um, you know, who knows? Down in the future, maybe things will improve. Maybe uh, that's why I say share my posts, get me, get people to sign up to my, my YouTube channel. The more people that read and, and learn my stuff means that more people like you, right? Kim, Jamie, uh, Melanie. It's the simple things, and it's just spreading out, and that's it. And then people learn how to do it themselves for free. People, especially people who have fixed incomes, who can't afford to take care of their own dog to the vet even, or who can't take care of the psychological issues to pay for the medication. These are the people we, as our society, should be helping. And not even if we should have to help them, we can help them, right? We can share these things. I can share these things with everybody out there. I just need everyone's help to help share what I'm talking about, to sign up to, to these things. It's just because it's important. This is the passion I have now. Imagine if I actually get more well known. My passion is going to be even more so, right? I have the media, the newspapers, and all that stuff on me, right? And now they've shunned me and everything because it's not science based garbage. But it has to be science based and all that stuff. 
I didn't change the way I was. I still continued focusing on let's change the way the classical dog trainers work and the and the behaviors that are up at the top. Let's change these people's attitudes. And maybe that was a bad thing on my end because then I didn't get the fame that I was supposed to get and all that. I don't care. Sh share my work. Help your friends. Help people on fixed incomes. Especially them because they can't afford to do things and sometimes they make the worst choice. And I've heard many times, and you've all probably heard of it, what do I do? Do I pay for the medication and the training for the dog that's going to cost me $500 or do I kill my dog for 75 bucks? And I get a puppy again afterwards, right? So just, uh, again, this is what, what's happening. Okay, uh, I'm going to go to the next one, Christy Lee. And Chrissy had posted in my closed group again as well as you are part of it, Jamie. It's September 27th. Um, you know, it's very nice. Uh, you know, I love the fact that just getting these ap appreciation and all that stuff and everything. And, and, and Chrissy's following my social media accounts, you know, YouTube and all that. She has a four-year-old uh, uh, bulldog, Duncan, and an almost two-year-old uh, female, Cleo. And these two... Um, dogs. Uh, originally, he was reactive to Duncan. Was reactive to other dogs on leash. He was also hyper vigilant on walks and noises. He he could, he would react to noises outside the house. Right again, barking out the window thing. Would bark until he was told to stop at every noise. He just keep going, keep going. Right, okay. Uh, and um, a trainer once told them that his fear of aggression was due to his legs being too far back in a retreat stance when he was barking and lunging. Right. He's just like, let's just find any excuse to blame the dog for that instead of going. I don't understand what's wrong with your dog. So, talk, uh, talking about walking at a safe... Uh, okay, Aaron, we're not going to even go there. Uh, but it was stressful and wasn't enjoyable to walk with them. Um, uh, and all that stuff. They even took him to a master dog trainer. Uh, and then then he he, he 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 went back to being a jerky dog again and being reactive to people and all that. Um, uh, so, let's just see... Um, yeah, so they were both they were both reacting and fighting back at each other, attacking each other, and all that stuff. Okay, so long story short, right? And one of them's on Zoloft as well. She's on Zoloft. Oh no, he, uh, Duncan's on Zoloft, right? The medication, all that stuff, and, and all that. But attacking each other, reacted to everything, and um, you know. So Christy uh, posted uh, yesterday. Just wanted to update you on our progress. I'm being very persistent with your recommendations. Sometimes if I've got my hands full. Or I'm cooking, or have my, or have my hands in the sink. I can't get to Duncan to hold him, but I do it multiple multiple times a day when he's reacting. He's laying with me now, and even with his 50 pounds of uh, of weight on my chest, uh, and is listening when I simply say the word "stop" to his ruckus. That's it. She's talking to him as a normal conversation. Dogs understand normal conversation. He and Cleo are spending more time near each other, and he even forewent a moment today when he would normally have gone after her, like to attack her. But he didn't this time. He thought about it, reasoned. So you see that? Self-regulated. He thought. Thinking. Amazing. She says, amazing. He also seems to be a little more calmer outside. Not as much vocalizing when waiting for me to give him his outdoor toys. I keep torso. Yeah. So even on, on her hand, right? Two, uh, a month later. Update. Here we go. It's working. But it's not working like it's like magic. It's just because she did the hard work. Same with Melanie and same with you, Jamie. Right? You're all uh, Kim. Same thing. You're doing the hard work. Right? It's not. It's not magic as per se. It's just like and now you see it, right? Same with you, Kim and Jamie. You see, it just makes sense, right? It makes sense. It just makes sense. There's no. There's no need to create magical storylines and all that stuff. It, it, it just. It, <laughs> um, and that you know, and I'll, I'll finish off because I'm like, oh, wow, over an hour and a half here. Um, what is it? L love what you just said. The re Norwegian dog bl bl blogs are like, if you can't afford training, vet, etc., you shouldn't have a dog. <laughs> That's because of the cost of it, right? You know, there's, there's, I charge for a private session, it's $230 for a two hour private session. And there are people out there like Rebecca Ledger charges $400 for one hour and then she ends up throwing treats to the dog. She ends up giving medication uh, prescriptions to the dog. It's like, what a what a waste of time. Well, I've been getting you know okay. Thank you, Jamie. Um, so so it's this aspect that we're applying. So instead of not being able to afford a dog, Rita, is that sense of understanding your dog. Like look at the things that I'm doing, everything that I'm talking about. I uh, here's the thing. 
you're talking about the behaviors like Rebecca Ledger and, and Ian Dunbar and Karen Pryor and all these people. Temple Grandin as well, right? Temple Grandin re recognizes one of the top 100 influential people by Time Magazine for what she's done for animal behavior. And I say to everybody, uh, because she, she says openly that she has autism and she says that the dog thinks like an autistic person does. But she doesn't realize, because in her simplicity of comprehension, is that the dog, that the animals and all that stuff don't have the sophisticated brain structure, the complexity, the contextual aspect of comprehension and processing on the human brain, right? The dog doesn't have that. So the structures she's talking about, she's just like she's like scratching the surface. She's like on her tricycle as well because uh, she talks about dogs, uh, uh, animals see things as paintings. Paintings? Paintings? As I said, dogs process time through abstract memory, through slivers of frames, of picture frame aspect. She doesn't even know why a dog, how animals process pain, uh, process pain or how they process uh, time. She doesn't even know why. And then she's at Tufts University. But then these are the people who are leading the pack down the incorrect path. And then they're the ones saying, well, the dog can't be fixed. All right. So I, I struggle. I fight for this stuff. Hey, Zeus, how's it going, man? <laughs> so I fight and I struggle to prove the simplicity of what I'm doing. I have, I, I'm in a group here in Vancouver. Uh, I'm not going to name it, but I have trolls all over. And they come after me. And they're brutal. Uh, Jackie Porteous is one who's brutal. Uh, just rude and ignorant. Um, Kate Vassell, they come after me. Like, I'm just going to name them because, you know, they used to just kind of hide behind all this uh, thing. They just come after me. Amber Cotto, all these horrible people that would come after, come on my own page and attack me on my own rescue page and attack what I was doing unsolicited. Renee Erdman, all these people come after me. They're like, well, we don't approve of James. It's not science based. Oh, yeah, that's why you're killing all these dogs. But the thing is, I've worked with 100% of the dogs. I've worked with the predatorial dogs that have attacked 12 people or more. I see the pictures. I know the things that even the people that have the dogs don't even know. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, both of you. You're right, Jamie and Kim. Um, but so I, I do that. So here's the thing is, do you want to learn from somebody who's only at 60% and will always be at 60%? Or do you want to learn from somebody who's had experience at 100%? Are you going to hire, you know, and chuck your, you want to hire the star football player? Or are you going to hire the person who's third on the bench? This is the third on the bench people who are killing our dogs. These are the people who are saying this dog can't be fixed. These are the people who, when I try to put my word out in the, in the dog training groups, these are the people who kick me out. They go to the admins and say, yeah, this guy, he's not science-based. Hey, he's blah, 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 blah. He doesn't know what he's talking about. But they can't refute a single thing I've said. And when I talk to them and I post about psychology of the dog themselves in regards to the codependency, dependency, interdependency, interdependency, all these other aspects and the dog's one-tenth processing time and the low self-esteem and the way the dog is within the family aspect like it did with Jamie, with Kim, all that. They're like, yeah, he's an idiot. What? Really? You just close your mind off to stuff like that? Soccer. Oh, sorry, Chuck. Soccer. That's right, Chuck. You broke your leg. <laughs> See, there you go. I should have been watching football or playing football. <laughs> Nobody's kicking anybody's shins. Um, but so here's the thing, right? So that's where my experience comes from. And I, as I've said before, uh, you know, I'll, I'll, I've had people challenge me with dogs. I, go ahead and take, yeah, bring it in. And they think I'm going to turn them down. I'm like, no, why would I even turn it down? The dogs you're describing are just average median dogs. They're V4, V5, V6, maybe a V7, you know? The dogs are being killed above that. I'm looking actively, right, Jamie? Go ahead, ask Amy Rainoshek, right? Founder of Save Rocky, the Great Dane Rescue and Rehab. Elaine Dixon, founder of the oldest Great Dane Rescue in Canada, New Hope for Danes, right? I'm actively looking. I've said that to Eric, you know, Erica Kelly, uh, one Dane at a time. I've told these people, I'm looking for 150 pound plus or more, 35, 36 inch withers minimum, attacked at least six to nine people. I don't care about the dog reactivity. I don't care. That doesn't mean anything to me. Resource guarding, just normal. Extreme, I don't care. None of that means anything to me because it's just normal behavior for dogs anyways on the predaceous nature. So I put I put where I... where I, uh, uh, I haven't done... I have some... Actually, you know what, Zeus? If you look through my Facebook, through my videos and all that stuff, you'll see live group training. And I have a few up on my YouTube channel as well. 
And you can see me up with, yeah, Erica. Yeah, she's amazing, right? With Steve. I did a video for her with Steve and with Kron as well. Um, but Zeus, uh, in my videos, you'll see where I do live group training back uh, earlier this year with reactive dogs. And there's one where I'm working with 12 different reactive dogs. Nine are reactive, three are skittish. And within two and a half hours, they're all walking with each other. No treats, no medication. And you see the way I conduct with that. And when I do that, everyone is doing it themselves. And then the problem, though, is unfortunately people are like, oh, how do I do what James does? Because he seems like he's this magical kind of guy. One guy called me a magician. I'm like, I'm not a magician, right? It's a gift that God shares with me. But the thing is like, how did you do this? How did you do this? And I said, don't put me on the pedestal. Just believe you can do it yourself. And like you, Jamie, you're doing it. Kim, you're doing it. In person, Kim, Jamie, or right? You're doing it yourselves. I'm just showing you that you have permission to do it now. To trust your intuition. Evolution over the millions of years. Evolution. All right? And again, I believe in God, but I believe in evolution in the sense that time frame is, you know, that. Uh, okay, let's just see. You want to challenge? I get it. My dogs are normal to you. You deal with the more. I don't deal with it. Well, I just deal with the fact that the ones who are more victimized, who are more abused. All right? I, like, I try to go away from those terms of insane. Um, just try to get to the aspect of just talking to these dogs as if they are suffering. And I said the same thing as, um, you know, if a kid grows up, like and you, what you deal with, right? You deal with people who, who talk about suicide and all that stuff, Jamie, right? I recall that. So the thing is, you know, what do you do when you ha you're talking to someone who's thinking of killing themselves, right? You say, well, what's happened? What's your background? What happened? And then you find out that they were abandoned as a child and they were in foster care. And then the next foster care was worse. And then one after that was even worse. And then what happens to the human being? They become criminal in that sense of behavior or they become self-destroying and what do you do you do what i do with my dogs and what other people's dogs you find a reason why they're like that and then you help them understand it and, and that's what we want to do um Zeus, could you share some of, of uh with share with some as you evaluate these dogs lives i think that would be super helpful and watch you correct them and them. Uh, so here's what i was what i want to do so uh, I have a fundraiser through Patreon and GoFundMe. The, the, the links are in my description. It's I got $200 right now. Three people have donated. So once I hit $250 per donation block, then I will, I will post on my Facebook page and say, hey, anybody with a fixed income, you know, whatever, has a dog that needs training. And then... We'll do that. We'll select them. And we'll do a video of it and record it, put it up. Easy. If you look at the one um, with uh, Gordon the Bulldog, that was all dealt with in 70 minutes. Couldn't walk a disabled dog, reactive, all that stuff. A Vermont dog trainer. Okay, let me just see what this, uh, this guy, Vermont. I, you know what, guys? I'm going to go over time because I want to see who this Vermont dog trainer is dog so i'm just uh, finger typing and my screen is super far away from me so i can't see anything like that um and i i don't want to be mean and blah blah, blah so i'm just gonna uh, vermont dog trainer uh vermont dog b and b what's a b and b board and board and breakfast okay so uh vermont vermont dog trainer.com so for those of you who are following me vermont dog trainer.com is that the one, Zeus? Uh, it's a training boarding uh, facility located in northern Vermont, uh, bring, bring balance to, to their owners since 2007. Facilities clean and all that stuff. Okay, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Um, uh, Ian Grant's YouTube channel, where he offers useful. So we're now, okay, so I'm going to go to his YouTube channel here. 772 subscribers. Okay. So he has a photo of it. Dogs working sync to calm down. Hyper dog. This pack thing is dumb. The pack thing is dumb. It's 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 amateur. Bed and breakfast. Okay. Uh, which one do you want me to choose? Tail position. What? Oh, tail position. Oh my gosh, I'm gonna laugh at that. It's not tail position, dummy. It's tail behavior. There's no such thing as tail position, tail set, because what he's trying to do is commercialize and make mediocre the tail set that's been set by the APDT. Tail set. Da da da. It's not tail set. Oh my gosh, how silly. It's tail position. 
I'm sorry, it's tell behavior. Uh, sorry, and now I'm losing it because it's that, like that's such a dumb thing. Tell position. Tell behavior. Position is a fixed place. The dog's tail is wagging back and forth, up and down, and all that stuff. It's cognitive and emotional process. It's consciously and subconsciously rooted from any aspects of concern, and worry, fear, as possession, so forth, like that. That's what tell behavior is. See, now you guys are getting me uh, nice and spontaneous. I love this organic aspect of it. Okay. So he's got a great day. It is I'm a beautiful morning here. What does it mean? Thursday morning. It's 12 minutes long. And we are out with the dogs. Doing our laps as usual. Hope you guys are watching this. Bart. Bart. Hey. And he snaps his finger. Hey, okay, snaps his finger. I'm pretty well half asleep. This, the snapping, none of that occurs in the natural behavior of dogs. <laughs> Do you see any dog, anything like that? And what I said to you, Kim, yesterday, right, in the tr rain, the pouring rain, I was drenched, we were all drenched, the, 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 the traffic, I said, you make this noise, with all that sound, he, the dog can't even hear you, and he's only five feet away from us, he can't hear you going, conversation, conversation. Harrison and Lucy, hey kids, moving around. Okay, I'm going to fast forward this so I don't get so... Uh... ...some point to talk about today. Okay, he's going to talk Always about. good to do a little teaching here. Oh, he's going to teach us. So nothing happening. Good. He doesn't understand. He doesn't... Yeah, he's talking about... So, the, he does, my girl Gemma. My girl Gemma. Being a little rough, so I got to step in. So here he goes. My little girl, Gemma, being a little rough because what happened is Gemma is a bigger black dog and grabbed the other dog that's a piebald, you know, black and white dog and grabbed her by the back of the head and kind of, and the other dog dropped down and all that stuff. And then what does the guy say? Oh, my, my girl's being a little rough. It's part of the dance of play. And what does he do? He snaps his finger. This doesn't mean anything. What do you do to a waiter? What does the waiter think of you? You're a piece of garbage. You just snapped your fingers at me like I'm a dog. There's no respect that he has for this dog. He has no respect. So that means he's had a strong relationship in the popularity department. Hey. He doesn't use her I'm name. I'm going to pull her away. I'm he going to start walking. He pulled her away from that as opposed to just watching and allowing Gemma to understand the capacity and the cognizance of her environment. Come on. Okay, he's Come still on. holding her, still holding her. There's Mr. Jasper, the big great Dane heroes hanging out here. Lily. Lily, Lily. Lily's owner just had a baby, so she's got a new addition at home. On. He's been doing fantastic. The little spaniel. Gosh. Uh, six shepherds out here today. Not the, you know, not the funny stuff that you put in brownies, but... Uh, so we're at two minute, cake, two minute time frame now. Just a mixture, a little bit of everything. Two minute time frame. They're going through the culvert. So here's a good look at Kosh, the spaniel. He's been doing fantastic. Holy cow. One of the shepherds. There's Tippy. This is Sokka. Amazing. Of what it's like to be outside with the group. Okay. The dog's something to do. I mean, good lord. Oh, okay. Sorry. Look at this guy. At 2.45 minute Jasper. now? Jasper. Hey, buddy. When he's running around here, it's like a Clydesdale running around. Oh, gosh. And so here's some body language over here. Oh, okay, so some body language. So this is Bart. We're at black dog. 3 minutes, 11 and then seconds. Raymond is the shepherd. We're at 3 minutes, 14 seconds right now for those of you following on his uh, thing. September 14, 2019 episode, Vermont Dog Puppy. Trainer. We're talking about body so behavior. So we're just going to sit and watch, we're see what sit happens and watch here. and see what happens here. Raymond wants out of here, so he's moving. Let me just see if I can switch. This always over here, interactions man. going on out here. Always, always, always. Even as they go by each other, just looks out of the corners of their eyes. Okay, so here we go. Everything. This is Seamus. Seamus is a five-month-old puppy. I mean, look oh, at this guy. My fault. Look at this guy. He's so cute. Ah. He is. 
and he's pretty chill too. So, so those of you pretty can watch chill. it, right? Okay, so let me. Oops, sorry. Let me just get this thing here. I have this little thing here. Sorry. Big so one thing that you can look at, we can talk about for body language, is everybody's tails. So I'm gonna hang here in the middle for a second. Tails tell a lot about state of mind. So let's look at this girl right here. Sunshine. See this tail? Look at the base of the tail. Don't pay attention to the curl. So the base of the tail is, is what tells you where the brain is. Oh my gosh. He doesn't understand it's subconsciously rooted for crying out loud. And that position right now is an actual conscious behavior on this dog's end. Holy cow. So if it's straight out from its back, it's usually somewhat neutral. Do you see? If it Okay, so his... His statement, Zeus, when he goes, oh, well, if it's straight up there, then it means it's neutral. But it's at the base of the brain thinking thing, I'm a jiggy. What? So then how's it neutral? Uh, and isn't anyone or an animal always conscious anyways? So that means they are thinking, unless you're a drooling piece of jello. Up is going to be a little bit more uh, alert, stimulated. Uh, up. He does know. You can hear him struggling for words. Up is a little bit more stimulated, and uh, uh, no, it's not. It's a cognitive process of a, uh, uh, of um, uh, which we call it, a comprehension in this aspect of it. Oh, Obviously, low and tucked is going to be more scared or nervous. Low and tucked is not scared and nervous. Oh my gosh, it's a subconsciously rooted aspect of fear base. So as you watch all these dogs pass, see, look at the tail, of the brown one right there, up and curly, but the white one behind them, the base is out straight. Because of the different individualization of the dog's consciousness and processing of their environment is what's happening. That's why the two dogs have two different positions. So let's see what he has to say now. You see? No, so it's okay. If you look at the tails of everybody around, this is what gives you the most feedback about what they're doing or what they're thinking, what they're going through. See little Lily back here? See how it's just kind of, well, as she faces us. Even the, the Great Dane here, you see how it just kind of goes off his back, straight. So don't pay attention to the top, pay attention to the, the base of it. Okay, so I'll switch it back here. I, you're, you know, you're right, Zeus, I shouldn't be bashing somebody like that. I mean, you know. Okay, so, so the individual aspects, you notice every single dog has their own different behavior. So let me just put that out here. Uh, let me get this out here. You know, okay, so you notice that each and every single dog has their own different behavior some are straight and some aren't straight sorry this is a little bit angled out here in, in that part so it's individualistic to the dog's behavior and that behavior is individualistic which means it's personality of the dog and the way the dog is processing and it's indicative of the dog's level of intelligence logic processing emotional processing as well and how the dog is able to put everything together based that with including the aspect of subconscious concerns recognition processing He's talking about the dogs is, is up like this, like a sail and all that stuff. The reality is, okay, sorry. Okay, sorry. <laughs> okay, well, let me just say this part then, Zeus. You know, I just, is because because what, the thing that happens is when people start putting things out that they think is correct, and, and hearing me saying I'm correct too, right? But when they put things out like that and they don't have the experience to that level, I mean, it was not even this guy. I've seen other stuff, what other people have said, which is even more flowery. What ends up happening is then people think, oh, well, this is right. And then they're misconceived. And then, you know how many times people say, well, two dogs are meeting each other and then one dog's tail is, then they're both wagging the tail and then they start attacking each other and we don't know why because they were so friendly. It's a processing. If you think about it, it's processing. The negotiation aspect of it is processing. It's conscious aspect of it, yada, yada, yada. Okay. But here's the thing is, Brent, okay, awesome, Jamie. My God, you're, you're so awesome because you're like, yeah, you, you understand what I mean. So the tail behavior on the width, the motion, the strength, the musculature integrity of that movement and how the dog does it. Even the dog does a figure eight or a half swish, you know, like they, you see that the, the little cancer uh, ribbons like that, how they do these aspects. And sometimes the dog swishes one way only and the other way, cognitive worry, all these aspects. It's, it's a conscious behavior that's rooted in a more deep seated subconscious concerns that they've learned through their life experiences. So all this tail behavior, and like not even this guy. Like you're right, and I apologize, Zeus. I shouldn't do that, and it's 
not professional of me, but like every it's it's like like this guy compared to Temple Grandin, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> like Temple Grandin, he's she's at the top, Tufts University, yada yada and all that stuff, right? When I read the stuff that that Temple Grandin writes out, it's like reading what a child tells me why the sky is blue. You see, Jamie, what I did with your dog, Kim with your dog, in person or not in person, it's not me trying to be a jerk. It's just me so absolutely frustrated because the people who are at the top of the food chain have lost the desire to think anymore about it. And if you think of Jane Goodall, who went in there, you know, just basically an assistant with no education at all in that sense of it. And she went, oh, you know, why don't we just name the primates instead of giving them numbers? And then what did her... Her, the the scientists, the PhDs, the way at the top of the food chain say she's the she's a dumb woman, right? Because at that time of the, the decades ago, she's a dumb woman. She doesn't know what she's talking about. She's an idiot. And where is Jane Goodall now? And where are those people who criticized her? And what did she do? She's stuck with him. You know, I have a I have a hunch. I think around a lot of if I think they are right or not. I just got a bunch of saying I can't know what you're talking. Yeah, no, I, I understand. I just It's just so frustrating because uh, Zeus is that these are the people who then push forward. And not only do they push forward, these are the same people who fight back and say, no, I'm right and you're wrong and you don't know what you're talking about. And then they close their minds. So when somebody's talking about something like this, anybody's talking like this, and they're, in their head, they're right and everybody else is wrong other than the anecdotal or the literature that they've been reading here i know sorry sorry i know okay sorry i'll stop on that um when it goes to the tail behavior and all that stuff it's a cognitive process of it right like i said it's emotional aspects it's relational to everything that the dog is doing as a presence of mind in the conscious processing same thing okay let, we'll talk about hackles race right i talked about hackles before and i'll just loosely talk about this because now we're almost two hours in right you see the thing about hackles the front hackles and I and because this camera's reversed, so the front hackles, and the back hackles, and then full hackles, right? They call pillow erection, and what a, 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 a former client of mine said, full mohawk. Okay, so the full mohawk when the, all the the hackles are raised right up, and and what have have they said on that discussion is, oh, you know what? When the hackles raise up, it makes the dog look bigger. This this much of a raise is going to make the dog look bigger. And the hackles, when two dogs are about to square off, I don't think the other dog can see around the other dog's ha head and see the hackles. I don't think the dog has x-ray vision to see through the hackles. Oh my gosh, dog dot hackles, he's up a quarter inch bigger. I better run away. <laughs> hackles, front loaded and... Uh, just the little time we had together today, Winston uh, was so much better. He was not even barking at the windows, walking by the window today after a while. I know, Christina, you were amazing though, right? Like, like you. Anyways, uh, I don't want to gush on it. We're gonna see uh, again, right? But yeah, you you saw that. You just had to talk to him. You just had to talk to him, and you had to talk to him in a certain way and let him understand what he was and his valuation as a life, as a being, as God has asked us to do. You want to recognize that life. The psychology behind him and then he goes oh wait a minute you're actually talking to me like i'm part of the family again or part of the people or i'm value conversation all that stuff and we get the certain tone right and i had to work with you plus you know you got your two kids and your your husband so there's four people so i had to figure out how to work the voice key that tone that's going to be homogenous throughout your whole family and what language to use throughout your whole family and i gotta do that right there while i'm there because you're watching me like yeah i just paid this guy 200 bucks <laughs> right so i had to figure out how to run it so that you all understood what I was talking about and, and, and change that language in that way. Um, okay, so for some reason, uh, yeah, he got it. So, but you'll see, we'll, we'll, we'll meet again because I owe you a session because I, I screwed up the schedule. Um, but yeah, so when it comes to the, to the hackles, front and back and all that stuff, it's conscious and subconscious behavior. I'm not going to go into detail about it at this point in time because I'm running two hours in now. Um, but it's conscious, subconscious behavior. And the full pillow reaction, if you think about it, if it's full mohawk on the dog, that means they're both consciously and subconsciously aware of what their environment's happening. Think about that. Makes sense. Um, uh, Zeus, I apologize. Like I say, it's just, it just drives me nuts because, you know, I've been trolled by Learberg. Like, 
un, un, unsolicited, just trolled the heck out of me on, on one of my live vlogs. Uh, I've been trolled by uh, lots of people, people throughout North America. So uh, I guess, I, you know, I'm a little bit raw about that stuff. And then when I look at the stuff and I go, oh, gosh, right? And it just, this is what people are, are you know, like Temple Grandin, like uh, Karen Pryor. They're just leading people down this path that they have no idea what they're talking about. The treat training of dogs with dysfunctions, for example, Zeus, right? The treat training of the dog is like we're giving dog food to behave when in actual fact food doesn't exist as a communication tool. And then, and further, in fact, food is a value. Food is something that dogs fight over. Like I talked about earlier, they fight over it to kill each other to get food. But we're using that to convince the dog because it's a domesticated dog and the dog is really friendly and happy and yada, yada, yada. It's like, oh my gosh, right? I feel like McCulkey Culkin, right? Home Alone without, you know, all the other issues he's got now. <laughs> but this is what, what I'm seeing, right? Like I said, I see things at two tenths of a second. And it just, when we start thinking as fast as our dogs, because they react at one tenth of a second, we can do so. Major league players, major athletes, Olympians, their reaction time is, is as fast as Bruce Lee's. Two tenths of a second. Bruce Lee could see a light in a Seattle Science Center where he was tested. He could see a light and press a button. His reaction time of waiting, you know, we're all waiting for it. And you see that reaction time and the reaction time happens where he sees it. So he inputs that, that stimulus, cognitively processes that stimulus and physically manifests it by pressing the button at two tenths of a second. If we were all as fast as Bruce Lee, we would say, you know, Bruce Lee is an average guy. Bruce Lee is slow. Bruce Lee is an average guy. Um, yeah, Zeus, there's one on my uh, YouTube channel, uh, which is Axel, the German Shepherd, and he's muzzled. I think, I think it's the second or third video that I have on my YouTube channel. He's muzzled, and he actually muzzle punches me in the face once, uh, and there's a few aspects of it. And I said to his family, because... Like, I always try to give them a proper timeline, but then I go, uh, then they start to think, oh, there's no way. And this is a dog that has attacked people, strangers, but two family members and two different times in the face, uh, attacked other dogs. He has a dangerous dog designation by animal control, six-sided fencing, which means four sides, top and bottom, has to be hard packed on the bottom that he can't dig through or cement, and then fencing on the top so he can't escape. And I said to his owners, it'd take me 47 minutes. And he's muzzle punching me. And, and I'm talking as in, I said, you guys just go on the other side of the fence and I'll take care of him. And like, oh, right. You can hear the nervousness in it. It took me 36 minutes. I knew it was going to take me less than 47 minutes, 36 minutes. So that's the behavior that goes on that we can address the dog because they're reacting that fast. They're processing that fast. So if we think dogs are too stupid and they're not going to learn anything, we're the ones who are, who are who are arrogant about that. And then people say, oh, well, you know, you can't fix a dog, right? Yeah, you can. I mean, Jamie, you're looking at it. Kim, you're looking at it. Christina, you're looking at it today from that, right? The biggest part is consistency. And because the dog's overt codependency, not to be like, ah, like that, but it's like, I love you. I'm going to do whatever you want me to do. Boom. Go ahead. Yeah, video. I mean, you said post it up again, Jamie. So, so this is what I'm saying uh, as I finally close off and everything like that. Um, you know what, Zeus? In three months, the family practice on their own. And, 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 and here's the thing. In three months, okay? And that was a free. You'll see it's a contest winner. I was sponsored by Hemp My Pet. And they're a great company, a great CBD oil. They, they are vertically grown, uh, organic in, in Colorado. Um, it doesn't come from China as, you know, raw. So it's, it's all done here. And so they did a sponsor contest and they actually gave me product that helped my, my uh, beloved Leo, uh, beloved Nero live two and a half years longer because I got him at 10 years, four months and he lived till 13 years, seven months, one week old, um, passing away June 11th of this year, um, um, 11.54 a.m. here. But here's the thing is, so three months later, Axel was downgraded from dangerous to aggressive. And... A year later after this now, no more designation on them, and they haven't had any incidences. So it's not me being magical or anything like that. It's just the humans themselves, the family, practicing and practicing and practicing, and it's done for free. Like the stuff I'm talking about, it's all done for free. So you think about the hackles raised, 
conscious and subconscious behavior on that aspect where it's rooted. And then when you think of it, when it's all together, it's conscious and subconscious. Think about that. I agree. I agree. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, Christina, thank you. Um, but so just think about when you watch a dog with the hackles up next time, you will figure it out on your own. Use your intuition. You're going to figure out where the conscious part is and the subconscious part of that dog's behavior. And when you see the full hackles raised up and you see the way that your dog reacts or the other dog reacts and then the hackles are up full mohawk and all that, you will put the two and two together. It just took someone like me <laughs> to go and say, you know what? You're gonna. I might die today. I might die tomorrow. I might die in an, in an hour from now. I mean, there's times where Tonka would would follow me. Nero. There's a video that I showed with Amy uh, about me with Nero. And I've talked about this before, where he had, went and took to to attack me, and I actually sat back down and had my arm in front of me as I'm petting him, and he's growling in a low guttural growl, and I have this arm in front of me, my left arm, which is camera right. And I have my left arm in case he goes to attack my face. Or, well, he would go for my throat before he'd do that. So I had that here just in case he went. I'd rather have him attack here than go for my throat. And then, and Amy, uh, like I said, founder of Save Rocky, the largest Great Dane Rescue in North America, was like, uh, you've got gonads of steel. But it's not that. It's just the connection that we have. So we can do that. Um, and actually, uh, within a month, they were just so surprised with what's going on. Yeah, I, I'm hoping once we get the $250 plus on, on that part of the, the fundraiser, then I will put up a post. Who who would like to be part of it? You have to be on a fixed income, etc. Oh, my battery's down 15% from 100%. Um, uh, who, who is this? And then what I'll do is I'll have people post about their dogs and the storyline. And then I will leave it up to the audience, to my viewers, to my faithful followers to pick who I should be working with. Arbitrary. So if it's the most dangerous dog, it's the most dangerous dog. I don't care. If it's the most docile dog, work with a docile dog. And then I'll say, what do you want to achieve? Well, I want to be able to walk him without or her without, well, you know, I don't want Ziva to attack people anymore. And then we work on that part and then you guys will get to see it. So it's not, that's the thing. How many trainers, behaviors do you know are ever going to say that publicly? And, and not just Axel where I proved it, do it again and again. Not because I'm great and amazing or brave or whatever it's because i need to get my message out that this is very real and it can happen for every single dog in our world six million dogs are killed annually that's a six percent kill rate out of a hundred million dogs in north america six six million dogs killed i'm glad i have i have to fix his beard or he will be so you know he has shown so much improvement in 18 hours using james oh thank you jamie um you know, so it's that one thing, the simplicity of all, and that's why I get attacked by everybody that's a trainer behaviors. Except for those who are actually contacting me, hey, hey, you know what, I would like to learn. And I, you know, because they think, well, why, why are we going to learn from some guy who has no training whatsoever and just brags all the time is what they say, right? And they're like, you know, what? I, I, why don't I just learn and figure it out? Some people get it, some people don't. If you look at the people who are subscribed to my YouTube channel, about 70% of them have five or less subscribers. A lot of them have zero subscribers because those are the trainers and behaviors that are following me. They're not allowed to publicly associate with me. Like I said the other day about uh, CBD oil and, and James. If it's not science-based, CBD oil is not approved legally, can't recommend it. James is not science-based, so we can't recommend, but everything's been done. It's all proven. I'm going to have that Jindo, uh, Cody the Jindo video out where uh, Nami Kim, and, and people who know who Nami Kim is, quite famous, uh, rescuer from Korea, uh, uh, Cody slash Alex, two and a half years, fostered in Korea, then Los Angeles, then the Vancouver. Lots of money spent on training. Nobody could progress and put him on leash. He would bite through the leash. Put a, a chain leash on, he would bite this chain leash till his mouth was bleeding. He wouldn't leave the couch in, in the foster's uh, living room. He couldn't even go outside, so she actually had to make a special place for him outside in the backyard. Science Space, I mean, you're going to have to Google what they say about Science Space because it's just this thing that I just go, wow, that's silly. Yeah, same here because they're like Science Space. Well, they're talking about Science Space being what the animal behaviors and all these people say are 
the tried and true formulations. But I'm falsifying all of that on their end because I'm proving it wrong on their end. Um, but so Cody, Alex, he's the one that they could, Foster, she's got a huge, beautiful backyard. It's got to be like three quarters of an acre. It's beautiful, all fenced in. And she said, he's as long as he's, he's been with her for over two months, he'd never gone to the backyard outside area. So she ended up having to make a small little area, and she has other dogs, where he she could just let him go and run into a small little enclosed area, which you'll see at the end of the video. But trying to get him off the balcony and outside and all these things, she had never done before, and nobody else had. He, he'd been living in a kennel. There's some really sad-looking uh, uh, photos that's in the video. It's heartbreaking. Um, but able to progress him forward. Yeah, FTA approved. I know what you mean. Um, man, I, um, okay, so I, I want to thank everybody for following me. I'm like I said, I'm down to like 10% from 100% of uh, uh, record time. Please share my videos, please um, um, show uh, you know, subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please, mo please move this stuff up as we can as we go forward. Lincoln, Lincoln, um, they're just in the bedroom, so they're getting a little impatient now. Um, uh, so yeah, again, you can see what I'm doing tomorrow. I'll come on. I, I, I'll, who knows what I'll talk about tomorrow. Tomorrow's Friday. I have group sessions for skittish dogs on Saturday and Sunday. And, um, I have four dogs on each day. So I'll do that. And, uh, here comes the crowd. So, um, Minky, stop. Minky, Minky, Minky. Hi, Minky. Right? So even this conversation, Christina, is a lot different than it is with with um, uh, with um, Winston, right? So we just talk him down, different tone of voice, and Lincoln was right, different tone of voice, everything like that. Um, you're very welcome, Zeus, and I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Uh, this will be up in a couple of hours. Well, I'll be up already, but I'm going to go through all the key points and try to break it down again, um, and, and do that. Uh, you're welcome, Sammy. Thank you, everybody. Uh, please share my posts. Uh, please subscribe to my channel. Please help us, help me, help us save more dogs. Like the jumping up on you, all that stuff. Let's all do that. Yeah, the tone. Yeah, of course. Right? You get, you know, if you yell at your kids, they're being like, yeah, whatever, mom's is whatever. But with your dog, they're like, uh oh, right? Well, on Daxon's personality, it's a little bit different, though. <laughs> you're, you're welcome, Christina. Bye, Harita, and all that stuff. Um, I know these two hours, I, I, people who are watching it for two hours, I gotta say, I, I don't know, I, I admire, I respect what you all do, I don't know how you can hold yourselves uh, to watch me and all that stuff, I, uh, I'm just very, very uh, humbled and uh, grateful for, for the assistance that um, you're doing to help get this word out uh, and help me share this rare gift that I've been uh, been given by God to, to do so and um, this is just something that we help save lives. Absolutely, Zeus. Oh, after you watch your video, um, go look at go look on my YouTube channel, Arf Arf Bark Bark Vid Dog Training, and check out the Axel videos under the Hey Dog You're Okay ones. You can see the live videos as well. You can see where Leerberg trolled me, like he he got a whole bunch of people to troll me as well, and it's brutal. And I asked him a few questions like, how does a dog process time? And he couldn't even answer it. Right, all these little things that go on. You can see what he said originally. And then you can see his edited version, and I've got screenshots, so he can't delete it because I told him I have screenshots of it. And so you'll see where he initially kind of trolled me, and then afterwards he put on this long little like, rah, 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 and like, and I went, dude, you just you commercialized mediocrity. Um, and then that was it. There's no, and I said answer these questions, and he didn't answer them. And then whenever the people he sent forth and other trainers were like, rah, 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 I went, yeah, really. This is one guy actually. Um, I want to say that is uh, he he trolled me. So I went, dude, are you gonna troll me? Do I go to his channel? <laughs> I went to I went to I went to this other guy's channel where he's uh, training. I, I don't know what kind of uh, shit sound or whatever it is. Where they train the dog to attack. Minky, Minky, stop. Thank you. Where, where they train the dog to attack? Right. And so they're using a rope and all that, and, and they're trying to get the dog to bite things and all that. And so I, I watched this because it's only like four minutes, and I, and I just totally ripped him apart. And I said, "Dude, one, you're using a rope, which means that you can't even hold on to him if you could, because you're gonna get rope burn. Second is you can see where at certain moments where you're actually afraid of this dog, even though you're saying you weren't afraid of him, but you can see in your face. And then he deleted his comments off of my YouTube channel, off of that that live video uh, broadcast. It's got over ten thousand views on that one where they trolled me on. Take a look at it. You see, and he deleted it off of his own page, and he stopped following me. So that's what I'm saying. Uh, 
you know, Zeus, I apologize, but I just, I get trolled constantly by all these people who are at the top of their game in whatever little areas, and then they go, oh yeah, James doesn't know what he's talking about, but we can't disprove it, so we're just going to ridicule him, but we don't want to learn either, because we don't really care about saving dogs, we just care about our ego and our reputation, right? Because realistically, if you come up, if you're if you're known as a, as a top trainer in town, and you're with a dog that you can't handle, that's too dangerous for you, or too complicated, dysfunctionally for you, what are you going to say? You're going to say there's something wrong with that dog. You're going to say there's something wrong with that dog. Not me, not as in, like, I don't know what to do with this dog. It's too much for me. You're going to say there's something wrong with the dog. Then you have the other trainers a bit more present, more conscious, and they'll say, well, you know, uh, the, your dog's just that way. You should return your dog to the breeder, to the to the rescue, etc. But in some way, at least they're at least humble enough to go, you know what, I don't know what's going on. But you got the ones who go, there's something wrong with your dog, and it's your dog's fault. And then they blame your dog. Instead of saying, I can't, because again, if they get a dog that they can't deal with, what are you going to say? Like, you bring your dangerous dog, and they, you can't deal with it? You're going to say, that trainer, who's the best in the city, doesn't know how to take care of my dog, and he says he's the best. And then that trainer is protecting his ego and his and his bank account. Minky, stop it. He's training his... Minky! Thank you. Come here. Okay, good boy. So that way, the, the, the trainer behaviors are protecting their reputation. Like I said, Dr. Ledger, she's trolled me tacitly on uh, in her Vancouver newspaper column, Vancouver Sun newspaper column. And, and it just I just get it all the time, and I just go, well, you know what? Why be nice? Why, why try to play the commercialized game? It's not about the money for me. I mean, I, I give more pro bono out than I make in a month. God shared the gifts with me. I have to do what he asked me to do. Yeah, I know I hear you. I hear you. Uh, you know what? I, uh, I went after Upstate Canine Academy too for him causing a dog to be more afraid because the dog was muzzled. The German Shepherd was muzzled and he tried to get a slip on. Couldn't get the slip on. Then he made the dog freak out even more. And then he used the catch pole on this dog that was already fearful and scared and afraid and low self-esteem. Like I already know what's wrong with the German Shepherd, but I won't give this guy this information on it because I was like, he just made the dog even worse. Using a catch pole. So now that dog's going to have a latent fear of anything that looks like a catch pole. Brooms, etc. Even the vacuum cleaner. That's what we do. When we think we know what we're doing, we cause these issues. On my end with all these dogs, I step back and go, okay, you know what? You just you just, just work with me with a dog in my head. I'm like, you just do whatever you want. And then we, we work it out by there. Who believes in what? Uh, who believes in... In who was one that I only mentioned his name because they, that was my Oh, no, 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 don't worry about it. Uh, like I said, I, I, I've, I've been complaining about Temple Grandin, right? You know, Ian Dunbar. Ian Dunbar has that bite level skull that's bite level four, bite level five, bite level six, bite level four, causing you know a bite. Bite level five is that where they cause laceration when they bite in, and bite level six is when the dog has killed either a person or a, an animal. And I've already gone after that part of saying it's a rhetorical scale, right? Uh, regardless if you agree or don't respect is, is super or, or, or don't respect is super important integrity. That's what we practice with dogs. No, I, I hear what you say, Zeus. I, I really do. But on my end, um, just so just so you understand the scale of it, on my end, the problem is when I am seeing the mistakes that are being done repeatedly, as I say, the definition of insanity, and there's no desire on the individual's part to change it. And if they're not wanting to change it, the victim is always the dog. Always, always, always the dog. And when I see people who are saying things where they're putting themselves in a certain position, what ends up happening is the owner, the family, the parents will listen to the person and say, Minky, stop. Thank you. Minky. Minky. Right? I can't even see Minky. I'm just talking to him here. Um, Minky, stop it. Um, so the problem is then the information is becoming misinformation and then it continues, it, it, it propagates down the line and then it just gets put on as more and more propaganda. The, real, the reality is the victim at the end of the day, Zeus, is the dog. 100%, it's always the dog that becomes the victim. doesn't matter uh, who it is, the trainer, me, anybody. The dog becomes the victim at the end of the day. All right, guys. Uh, oh, I just don't feel bad for mentioning anything. 
it, it's okay. It, it's all right. I mean, you know, if he hears it, he hears it. If he doesn't, I, I've had, a, it doesn't matter. It just, it doesn't matter in that sense of it. If it makes a person improve their work, absolutely. If it doesn't, then they're stuck in that rut. But at the end of the day, for me, it is the dog's health, safety, and existence that is most important for me. That's where it, where it starts first, and then it's the human side of things. Um, anyways, you'll see. Look at the Axel video. You look at the stuff. All these videos. Uh, Gordon the Disabled Bulldog. 70 minutes for Gordon the Disabled Bulldog. For the top trainer behavior, so there's no way. There's, there's absolutely no way that um, this bulldog can even be picked up or touched. 70 minutes. And watch that video. That one, Minky. Minky stop, right? See, right, they're right here at the bone. Minky, stop. Thank you. Right? That's it. This conversation, and that's resource guarding. Um, but anyhow, all right, guys. Thank you so much. Talk to you later. We'll uh, hopefully talk tomorrow and, and go from there. All right? Bye-bye.